Chapter 51, 51. Naive She-Wolf. Tywin Lannister, the man who brought glory back to the house Lannister, the one who served as the hand of the king, could not describe the fear he felt when Lord Alexander Stark lifted Robert in the air like he was a small babe and his words too, each word felt like an arrow, meant to destroy any shred of guts. He truly felt scared at that moment. He felt like running straight to the harbor, grab a ship and go find what's west of West Arrows. At least there would be a chance of living. But thankfully, nothing happened and that beast in the human skin left. I must return to, I need to regroup my army and send them back. This war has cost us enough money already. Tywin bowed to puzzled Robert sitting on the throne and left. Only John Arryn was left there to make sure that Robert doesn't really kill himself for having Targaryen blood. Alexander went to harbor, a ship owned by the vassal house of Starks, House Manderley. They lorded over the biggest port in the north, the White Harbor. He went up and straight into the private cabin. Three people were waiting for him. Varys had gone back to report at the Red Keep and swear fealty to the new king. Elia quickly walked up to him and held his hand. She had tears in her eyes. Thank you, my lord. If it hadn't been for you, they would have done those things to us. I can't even imagine the horrors. Her face turned pale. Varys must have told her. And you will never have to face them. I will treat you like my own daughter and give you home, though I'd prefer to be called grandpa. I'm much older than I look you know he tried to ease the mood. She smiled, yes, Lord Varys told me not to judge you by human standards and I can feel it. You are, different than everyone else. Haha, <laughs> yes I'm quite unique. Let's get back to the main point. From now on, you will be called Alina, Renis will be called Rena and Aegon will be called Eric. He is too small so it won't be a problem to teach him the name. But you and Renis must practice. I've prepared a fake story for you too. Still, if someday someone tried to trouble you, you will quickly press this ring and a wolf's sword will immediately find you. I'll try to make your life as easier as possible in the north but still, please forgive me if life is not as refined as in the south. Alexander said, no, my lord. You've done enough for us. I couldn't ask for more. Renis also likes you, she said, looking at her daughter who was showing the dragon plushie to Aegon. Well, that settles it then. Let's get moving now, Alexander said and went out. He looked around at the small ship and couldn't help but feel disappointed. This world was too slow in innovation. They hadn't even discovered gunpowder and cannons. Well, he wasn't going to invent them anytime soon though. Still, he could make magical cannons for his future fleet which could only be used by his people, it should also have a safety feature of getting transported back to me if it gets stolen. Magic was just too op sometimes. I think I'll make some big man of war too. Imagine the fear they will bring to the pirates. Though I need to find a fleet first. Dobby, Brandon, Howland, and Ned had reached the Tower of Joy with much haste. But they found three king's guards standing guard. Sir Arthur Dane, Sir Oswell went, and Lord Commander Gerald Hightower. Lord Stark, Sir Arthur Dane said. I looked for you at the Trident. Ned said, his words were interrupted by Dobby. We don't have time for that nonsense. I'll give you one and last chance. Yield, he said. And who the foo asterisk K are you? Gerald Hightower retorted. Haha, you have no idea who you're messing with. Brandon scoffed. Dobby didn't say more and dashed with an unimaginable speed for someone of his size. His giant sword slashed at Gerald Hightower. Gerald tried to block it but his sword was also cut with his throat. Without any warning, he also dashed towards Ser Oswell went and also killed him. By then, Ser Arthur had drawn out his dawn, a whitish legendary sword. Brandon spoke. You are my brother by marriage, Ser Arthur. Lady Ashura Dane is pregnant with my child. I think she'd want you to see your nephew. Please yield. Ser Dobby, alone killed 300 Lannister men just a week ago. You can't win against him. Brandon was a brute who had more muscles than brains but he truly loved Ashura and didn't want to kill a family member. Arthur lunged at Dobby only to be thrown away by the sword clash. Then surprisingly, he put his sword down. His last strike was to judge Dobby's strength and he had judged. You are really strong Ser Dobby. I yield. Princess Lyanna is up there, but if you try to harm her then I won't sit quiet. He pointed to the tower. They nodded and headed up. Ned was at the forefront and quickly barged in. Midwives were working on cleaning while Lyanna lay on the bed, covered by a blanket. Ned quickly ran to her. She broke down in tears when she saw him. I caused their deaths, father and brother. No, you didn't. Brandon walked and ran to her other side. She looked shocked and then happy. H how? Uncle came to Red Keep, alone, and got me out. But father was already gone. He also killed the Mad King, he quickly answered. I I missed you too, she cried. Dobby stood near the door, mentally talking to Alexander and telling him about the happenings. Alexander was currently on his ship to White Harbor and it would probably take three more days for them to reach. So, he went to his private room and operat to the Tower of Joy. Arthur Dane was still standing guard, alone. He cast a notice me not and walked. But then he felt like someone was watching him. He suddenly remembered the dim three-eyed raven. He quickly scanned the area and looked in a particular direction. The three-eyed raven felt like someone was directly looking into his soul and then he heard a voice. I'll give you a visit soon, prepare your best speech to convince me not to kill you. The three-eyed raven left the area and woke up in his tree, scared. Inside the tower. I don't want to die brother Lyanna teared up. The two brothers had their hearts shake due to helplessness. Then a voice came from behind. 
All men must die someday, but not today. Alexander walked into the room in his white Jedi robes. He took out a small bottle from his pocket and gave it to Brandon. Make her drink this. Brandon quickly fed her the healing potion and waited for some minutes. Lyanna also slowly started to feel a bit better. Then a midwife brought the small bundle of joy, wrapped in a cloth. The brothers were surprised but accepted the fact. Seeing that everything was going to be okay, Brandon decided to talk to his brother with his sister as a witness. Ned, I wanted to tell you something. I've decided to give up my lordship of Winterfell to uncle. He's a better leader and lord than me. I foolishly believed that Lyanna was kidnapped and got father killed. I am not suitable for the position. Lyanna quickly put her hand on Brandon's. No, big brother. It's my fault. I sent a raven to tell you that I'm leaving with consent, foolishly believing it would reach you. I, uncle is a much better lord than I. I lived most of my life in Vale. The northern lords respect him too. Ned said. But what about Benyon? Shouldn't we ask him too? Lyanna asked. Oh, come on. Benyon likes uncle more than father. He'd have no problem with this, Brandon added. Alexander decided to speak I am not going to marry, Brandon will still be my heir, so there shouldn't be a problem. But what should we do with Lyanna and little John now? Alexander asked. John. The three exclaimed. SH asterisk T, my tongue slipped. Obviously, you can't be thinking of giving him some Targaryen name now, let me be blunt. Targaryens are gone and there will never be another Targaryen dynasty sitting on the throne. He said seriously. But the prophecy. Rigor said the prophecy must be fulfilled. The three heads of the dragon's Lyanna started to blabber. Do not talk about prophecies in front of me. Targaryens ruled West Arrows not because of righteousness but because they could do it. The day they lost their dragons was the day they lost their right to rule. They are greedy and inbred morons who have more of a record of producing madmen than good kings. For a prophecy, you caused a war. A war in which many men, nobles, and small folks died. Many children became fatherless because of you and your late husband. Your prophecy ruined everything and you must accept that fact. Alexander coldly said. Prophecies are foolish things to believe in. Most of the time they just show a small part and not the big picture. Tell me, did Rigor know about this rebellion his prophecy would cause? You so foolishly believed the words of a man who had a family history of bloodline madness. A man who left his wife and children in King's Landing to get arped and butchered, a man who let his own mother get arped and beaten by his own father. If Rigor had an ounce of spine, he would have arranged an assassination of the Mad King. How difficult could it have been? But no, he chose a prophecy. Pure stupidity he added. He didn't care about the feeling of Lyanna right now, she needed to learn her lesson if he were to have her by his side. What she did was dumb and someone had to call it. Tell me, did he tell you about his prophecy? When the red star bleeds and the darkness gathers, Azor Aha shall be born again amidst smoke and salt to wake dragons out of stone. She said. Such a vague and pointless prophecy. Let me guess, Rigor used to think he's the prince that was promised and then later believe that one of his kids will be the prince that was promised. But guess what, the other two heads of the dragon are gone. Squashed and butchered by the Lannisters. Well, let me make this easier for you. The prophecy was talking about a person who will have dragon eggs and will also hatch them in a fire that can't burn them. Then he or she will become Azor Aha and fight the others slash White Walkers that want to return. White Walkers. I thought that they were old Nan's tales. Brandon exclaimed. They are real, son, believe me. I've lived longer than you can imagine. All right, this is getting on my nerves now. No prophecy matters in front of me. Sign these papers and Brandon will tell you a Stark family secret he dropped three magically binding contracts. If they try to tell anyone then they will be muted and compelled to come to him and confess their breaking of the contract. The person asking them will also be muted and compelled to come to him. Alexander picked up the little cute John and played with him while Brandon told them about him. After an hour, they all looked at Alexander with a changed look in their eyes. So, why you are the god of the world, Ned asked, unsure of himself. Yes, if the texts in the old town are to be believed. I am much bigger than just a god, but that doesn't matter now, Alexander shrugged. So, um, uncle, I mean, all father, how old are you? Lyanna stuttered. More than 15,000 years and you all should still call me uncle. Lyanna, do not fear me. I am not against you marrying Rigor and birthing little John, but you still believing in the prophecy. The prophecy has already failed, she wolf. And as long as I am in this world, no prophecy matters. So, I want you to spend the rest of your life happily watching John grow up. When he's old enough, you can tell him of his past. But we cannot let the world know about his parentage yet. They would be after his blood otherwise, especially Robert, he warned. Lyanna understood his point. What was a prophecy in front of a literal god? She was also worried about her son. What should we do, uncle? She asked. Fake identities, Ned can claim him as his bastard and Lyanna can be the nanny. I will change Lyanna's look so that no one can recognize her. Ashura is too nice of a girl. She might start treating him like her own son if we made him her son. While Ned's new wife, Caitlin will never treat him like a son, making the whole charade believable. There's another option though. I straight up go and kill Robert Baratheon. Alexander said with a serious face. No, don't kill him. I am ready to do this. As long as I can stay by his side. Lyanna said, lovingly looking at John. Don't worry, Robert won't live that long. He'll be the reason for his own death, that is if I don't help him. Ned, do you agree? He asked. 
I, I'll do it, Ned said with determination. All right, what happened in this room and all the talks we had and will be having about this topic in the future will be under the binding contract. You cannot discuss it with anyone except each other but I prefer you don't. We will also get Benyon to sign a contract and tell him everything, then Lyanna can meet him. Ned, you will come to the north via King's Landing and tell Robert that Lyanna is no more. Brandon, you will be going to Starfall to bring Ashura and your child. I'll take Lyanna back to my ship which will reach White Harbor in three days. Good luck chapter 52, 52. Rena plus grandpa equals fun. Pop. Alexander and now redhead Lyanna operate into the ship. This kind of travel is so convenient. I can't believe we just traveled more than half of West Eros in a blink. She exclaimed. These are the wonders of magic. Just wait for the changes I am going to bring to the north. You won't even be able to recognize it. Alexander bragged. It's really hard to imagine that my own uncle, on whose lap I played as a child, is a god. She said. Haha, well, there's not much I can do to make it easier to accept. Though I think you will be happy to see someone. Follow me, Alexander said and headed to Alina, Elias, room. Lyanna followed him. Alexander knocked on the door. Small footsteps sounded and a little girl opened the door. Grandpa, she happily called. Alexander swiftly picked her up, his face full of radiating smiles. He really liked spending time with children because they are pure and untainted by the darkness and cruelness of the world. They say what they think and do what they want. What's my Rena up to, H.A.? He asked. Oh, I was playing with Eric. I am the mother and he's my baby. Come, play with me, she happily said. Alexander went to the little Eric, Aegon. Lyanna also followed him. Hey, Rena, meet big sister Anna here, Alexander said. He was lazy with the names so he just removed L and Y from Lyanna's name. Rena, Renis, cheerfully looked at Lyanna. Seemingly found a new person to play with. Elia soon joined them and looked at him. Alina, meet Anna. If you two can recognize each other, I'll show you magic, he said. Yay, magic. Show me magic Rena jumped around. Both of them looked at each other for a minute or two and finally admitted defeat. But Alexander still showed the magic. All right, now just watch Alexander waved his hand and Lyanna, Elia, and her kids changed back to their original look for five seconds. A slash N, from now, I will use their new names until their identities are revealed to the world. Alina and Anna's mouth were wide open in shock. A moment later they had tears in their eyes and tightly hugged each other. They both asked each other the same question at the same time. How? Well, ladies. I am going to take Rena out now. You two can talk. Anna, take this contract and tell her everything after signing it. If she's to live with us, we can't hide it forever. Alexander handed her a magic contract. Then he picked up Rena and went to the deck. He didn't really care about revealing his identity as removing or altering memories was simple to him. He just didn't like doing it that much. Looking at people's memories, their whole life was not a very good experience. On the deck, Rena sat on Alexander's shoulders with her legs around his neck and looked at the coastline. She had also asked for a pair of sunglasses like his and Alexander happily conjured them for her. She kept on pointing at directions and asked questions. Those are the three sisters, Alexander said. Three sisters. Do they also have a mother? She innocently asked. No, my dear. They are three islands and bad people live on them, he said. Why a bad people? Let's go beat them she yelled with her little fist out. The seamen around them chuckled. We will, but not now. Your mommy will be in danger if we go there. Alexander said. Oh, okay then. Oh look, a magical ship. It's getting bigger she suddenly shouted. Her words brought everyone's focus back and looked at where she pointed. A ship was coming towards them. Alexander looked at it and sure enough, they were pirates. He then suddenly smiled. He was going to take the ship as his welcome gift. Soon the pirates came to attack. The men had readied themselves for protection but Alexander was faster. With Rena still sitting on his shoulders, he jumped onto the adjacent pirate ship. Because there was a little girl with him. He didn't draw blood. Instead, he punched them all and whenever his punch landed a funny honking sound would come. Rena happily laughed with each punch. Boom asterisk pow bam. Soon, all of them had been dealt with. According to their sins, Alexander then threw them from the ship to drown and die. Pirates had no place in this world, they were like leeches. Though, two guys didn't deserve to die. So he put down a rowboat and threw them on it. The ship was his now. It wasn't really big or great but still, it was the first step to a fleet. He also had those toy mana warships with 150 guns. Not to mention the steel Yamato warship. But that was for the future. Mana wars would only be used as main fleet leading ships. He was going to create a fully fledged navy with different ranks. 1. Seaman, responsible for the ship's operation and fighting. 2. 251st officer, commanders, and captains, responsible for piloting the ships. Each ship will have them. Each of their ships will have 24 magic cannons. At first, the captains will be smart human-like golems that Alexander would make. Then the golems will train a suitable first officer and make them captains. In some years, the new human captains will be promoted and take over the whole command of the fleet. In the beginning, all the officers would be smart golems. 3. 10 Commodores, responsible for commanding 25 ships. Each will command a smaller version of Manowar. Each ship will have 74 magic cannons. 4. 5 Rear Admiral, responsible for managing and commanding 50 ships. 
Each will command a man of war, 100 magic cannons, 5, 2 vice admiral, responsible for managing and commanding the 125 ships. Each will command a man of war, 150 cannons, 6, 1 admiral, will command the entire fleet of 250 ships. Only members of Wolf's Sword, elite warrior elves, will take this position at first. They will also train a replacement for themselves. They are free to find the most suitable candidate themselves. The Admiral will also command from a steel warship that Alexander brought. The ships were based on World War II Japanese Yamato. It was a very big ship. Alexander would have to make many changes to make it faster, better and deadlier in both long-range and close-range fight. He was planning on making four fleets of 250 ships, a total of 1,000 ships. He also knew where he could find that many ships, thanks to Dobby. You can see the image of fleet on illustration channel of my Discord, https colon slash slash discord dot gg slash dghcron. Or see them on Instagram https colon slash slash www.instagram.com slash Mr. Underscore Immortal Underscore Novel. Back at the pirate ship, Alexander summoned a human like Golem, from now on will be called Godroid, and told him to steer the new ship to Winterfell through the White Knife River. The river wasn't wide enough for ships yet but Alexander was going to take care of it soon. Did you like the show, Rena? Alexander asked. She hurried her arms in agreement. Then he returned to the ship and found Alina and Anna waiting for him. Alina respectfully gave him a bow. Apparently, giving respects to the god. Alexander shrugged and played some more with Rena. Later Alexander had Rena also sign a contract with her mother's agreement. The contract was made to protect her. It stated that if someone with ill intention or someone who hadn't signed a magic contract forcefully asks her about Alexander's magic or something related to him, then she would be portkeyed to Alexander's arms. Alexander had made a pretty locket slash port KF for her which had disillusionment from thieves and it wasn't removable. He also gave one to Alina, Anna, and Eric too. If some intended harm came to them they'd be port keyed to a secret safe room he was going to make under Winterfell. Inside the room will be a means to contact him or someone else from the Stark family. Alina and Anna could control it but Eric and Rena's were automatic. By the afternoon, they had arrived at White Harbor with the help of his magic making the ship go faster. Oh look. Sandy Beach Rena loudly pointed and stood up on Alexander's shoulders. She held his hair tightly. She must have never left the Red Keep and only heard about the beaches of the Dorn from her mother. Haha, let's go there then, he said and jumped from the ship. The ship was heading towards the harbor and the beach was just beside it. He landed perfectly with Rena still on his back. After letting her play there to her heart's content, they left for Winterfell. You can see the Rena plus Grandpa illustration on illustration channel of my Discord, https colon slash slash discord dot gg slash dghgron. Or see them on Instagram https colon slash slash www.instagram.com slash Mr. Underscore Immortal Underscore Novel. Lord Manderley wanted them to stay but he denied saying that soon they'll meet in Winterfell. Alexander was going to call the Lord's Meeting. They were supposed to take horses to get to Winterfell from there as the river was too narrow and dangerous, but Alexander used Nico's magic phone and used a cheat. Out of nowhere, a speedboat came in front of them. It was Jet Max. Rena jumped in excitement. Not for the boat but for magic. All right, take a seat. We'll be in Winterfell before evening, Alexander said and jumped to the pilot seat. Lyanna looked at the strange boat and asked, is it really that fast? Yes, it can go at 150 kilometers an hour, 92 miles per hour, he said, surprising them. They took their seats and he started the engine. It used fossil fuel, but Alexander was going to introduce some other environment-friendly alternatives to the world. He also didn't want to make the world too dependent on his magic as he would one day leave. The world also didn't have good powerful wizards like Potterverse. Hence, technological advancements were more preferred. Still, some things like pody wondering and simple rune making could be learned by normal humans. The engine roared and they moved into the river. Alexander started to use his magic in disillusionment for outsiders and made the river wider and deeper. Enough for three small ships to travel side by side. He did it all the way till the division of the river. From there he took a left, towards the wolf's wood. It had the nearest point in the river to Winterfell. After reaching the location, Alexander used his magic to make a nice looking dock and a big shed for the boat. It was going to be the Stark family's personal dock. His luxury yacht would also be parked here later. From there, Alexander took out three horses. Dobby was initially with them but Anna, Lyanna, had started to worry about John too much, so Dobby went as extra safety. Originally there was no road there but Alexander stayed in the lead and paved a nice off-road track. Later everything would be made permanent when he will start constructing permanent asphalt roads. Their journey was fast and smooth. Giggles of Rena made it even better. Soon they arrive at the gates of the humongous Black Castle, which didn't look as majestic due to overdue repairs. Didn't matter anymore though, he was going to make it the world's most magnificent castle that even the Taj Mahal would shy away. Chapter 53, 53, Starks Reunited. When they entered the courtyard, Benyon and Sir Roderick Castle were waiting. By now, Alexander's deeds have been spreading all around. People named the beheading of Mad King, Old Wolf's Revenge. I see, you've done a fine job as a lord. I think I'll have to find a nice castle and a woman for you soon. Alexander joked with Benyon. Benyon just shook his head and gave him a hug, which Alexander returned. 
Ah, uh, let me introduce Anna and Alina. They were attacked by robbers, so I helped them. Now they are under me. Alina can read and write, also very smart so she'll be working in the administration work. Anna is a good warrior, but for now, she'll help the little children. Alexander introduced them. He could feel Lyanna getting emotional seeing her little brother. All right, Sir Roderick, please show them some good rooms. Let's go Benyon. Talk in the solar, he said. The ladies started leaving with Rena looking at him, as if wanted to ask something. Alexander quickly picked her up in his arms and asked what was the matter. Grandpa, I don't want to go away, she said with teary eyes. The castle was very big, she must have thought he was sending her away somewhere in there. No my dear, I am not sending you away. You will live with me from now on, in this big castle. We will see each other every day. Your mama is just taking you to your room to sleep. He warmly said. She looked at him for a second and then gave a huge smile. Okay. He put her back down and she skipped to her mother. Benyon looked at his uncle and the little girl. She really likes you, uncle, he said. You were just like that when you were small. You even peed while sitting on my shoulders once. In fact, you used to fight your mother to stay with me every day, Alexander said, embarrassing Benyon. Brandon had it all easy. He had already secretly married Ishara so when he went to Starfall and told things to Lord Dane. He received a punch in the face and then a hug. He was angry at his daughter for marrying without his permission but in the end, he was happy that she found someone from a great house. Tragedy struck him and Ashura when they received the news of Brandon's death. Their marriage hadn't been announced so it would have been troublesome for the pregnant Ashura. But now, everything was good. Brandon was alive, and he also brought Lord Dane's son back home. No longer a king's guard. Alexander had to use some mind art to change Arthur's mentality. Now he was ready to take the lordship of Starfall. Ned would make sure that Robert doesn't name him a traitor though. In the Red Keep, Ned walked to the throne room with a small baby in his arms. Dobby and Howland following behind them. There was only Robert and John. Tell me, Ned, Lyanna is all right, Robert quickly asked. Ned shook his head, I couldn't save her. She died of fever when I reached there. Sir Arthur Dane was protecting her the whole time. God damn it, Robert shouted. Who's the boy, Ned? John asked. He's my bastard, he said, trying to make an embarrassing face. Robert howled in laughter, the Honorable Ned Stark sired a bastard. Gods, what has the world turned into? What's his name? John Aaron asked. John Snow, Ned said. Robert started to laugh again. You named him after me? I I don't know how to feel. I'm honored, I guess, John Aaron said, scratching his beard. Robert, I am also here to inform you that my brother has given up his lordship of Winterfell to uncle. He'll be ruling the north now, Ned said. I understand, Ned. How quickly Lord Ricard was killed. It didn't give much time for the north to make a smooth transition between lords. The north needs a strong leader like your uncle, John said. Surprisingly, Robert nodded. Yes, no matter what happened that day, I can't deny that he's a smart and strong man. Please tell him that I ask for forgiveness for my remarks on the children. What happened to them shouldn't have happened to any child. However, I still can't bring myself to forgive the Targaryens. I'll tell uncle. I should be going now, Ned said and left the King's Landing. His next stop was Riveron, he needed to pick up his wife. Brandon was supposed to marry Caitlin Tully, but because of his death and also the scheming hoster Tully, Ned and Jonaran were forced to marry the hoster's daughters in return for their support in the rebellion. Ned and Caitlin were basically strangers to each other, still, they had produced an heir. She had given birth to Rob Stark just a few nights ago. Caitlin didn't know that Brandon was alive and not only that, the lordship of Winterfell and the position of Warden of the North had been handed to Alexander. Caitlin was still dreaming about her son becoming the Lord of Winterfell in the future, but Hoster was furious, cursing Brandon, Alexander, and himself. When Ned reached Riveron, he was joyous to see his son, Rob. But then Caitlin asked about the baby. He's my bastard, Ned hesitantly answered. Caitlin threw some tantrums but what could she do? In the end, they all left for Winterfell. After half a moon, they arrived at Winterfell. Ned was completely shocked by what he was seeing. He had been gone for just a few months and Winterfell was unrecognizable. All the broken and damaged places were fixed. The ground around the whole Winterfell was now stone paved. There was no dirty mud or smell of it. The outside of the castle now was covered with white stone. There were also many golden sculptures of wolves around Winterfell. The biggest being on the main gate. There were so many Stark banners hanging on the walls, that even a mute would start speaking the world Stark. It didn't look like the dirty black castle now, it looked regal and fit for the lord of the biggest territory in the Seven Kingdoms. Alexander knew that Ned would be coming that day so he took little Rena and others and brought them to greet him. Brandon had arrived just two days ago viaduct ship. The ship he stole from the pirates was now being used as personal vassal of Starks. It made trips from White Harbor to Stark's personal dock and also the Winter Dock, which was on the other arm of the White Knife River on the other side of Winterfell. Many small ferries also take people from White Harbor to Winterfell now. Brandon and Ashura were a lovely couple. Ashura used to be a handmaiden of Alina, Elia, so they were already very good friends. The surprise came when they introduced their daughter two days ago. Uncle, meet our daughter, Alexandra. We named her after you, Ashura happily said. Alexander held the little baby girl in his arms delicately. His face showed a very happy smile and a tiny tear in the corner of his eyes. He looked at her closely. 
She had eyes of her mother but her face had some resemblance to Brandon. I might not be Brandon's father but they are all sons and daughters to me, so it makes little Alexandra my granddaughter. I bless you to always be happy, I bless you to never get sick Alexander touched her head and used his magic. His blessings would really never let her get sick now. For some reason, Alexandra started to giggle loudly, melting the hearts of everyone around. Rena started to jump I also want to see Arzanara too she couldn't pronounce the name properly. Alexander laughed and looked at Ashura you'll need to find another nickname for her. Ned, his wife, son, and Dobby arrived in the courtyard. Alexander gave the serious man a hug how was the journey, son? It was nice. I see you've changed the castle a lot. Ned said. This is just the beginning, Alexander said, also adding another thing to his list of things to do, change Ned Stark's attitude. Ned then introduced his wife. This is my wife, Caitlin Stark, and my son, Rob Stark. Caitlin, this is my uncle, Alexander Stark, Lord of Winterfell and the Warden of the North. Ned's words surprised the redhead. Welcome to the family, Caitlin Stark. This is Brandon Stark and his wife Ashura Dane with their lovely daughter, Alexandra. He introduced them. For some reason, every time someone said Alexandra's name, she would giggle. Ned looked happily at his brother, you named her after uncle. I owe my life to uncle, Brandon seriously said. Enough guys, let's celebrate now. Where the hell is Benyon? I told him to be here, Alexander yelled. Here, I I overslept, Benyon said. With home. Brandon teased him. Haha. All the Starks are here, with three extra. Let's celebrate, everyone he loudly said and led to the dining hall. His words pierced Caitlin the wrong way. She assumed that Alexander was talking about Jon Snow. She was also confused, why Alexander was the lord. In their journey, Ned had told her about Brandon and she had grudgingly accepted that. She had already given her maidenhead to Ned and there was no going back now. Chapter 54, 54. Wolf's Heaven. After a hearty meal, everyone resigned to their rooms. But the Starks were called for a meeting, except for the kids and the wives. Alina was also there as she already knew everything. The only person who had no clue was Benyon. All right, this room is secure for talking. Even if someone is standing at the door with their ear placed on it, they won't hear anything. Alexander said. What? How? Benyon spoke. Who'll tell Benyon? Alexander asked. Anna came forward, I will. For the next one hour, Benyon was made aware of things and also signed a contract. He kept looking at Anna, trying to find a glimpse of Lyanna. Alexander made her disguise fall for three seconds, which was enough for Benyon. He hugged her tightly and laughed. Now I know why I was having that feeling these past months, he said. Haha. Stop crying now Benyon. Come here and take a seat. The people in this room are the only people who know about me. Wait, there's also Lord Varys in King's Landing, Alexander exclaimed. Brandon suddenly stood up. That eunuch. How can you trust him? I saved his life when he was little and taught him how to talk with birds. He's also not a eunuch. I had helped him get his revenge from the sorcerer who cut his manhood and then used my magic to heal him. He just likes to act like a eunuch. He says it's convenient. Anyway, he's like my number one fanatic follower. He's been trying to find me for years and now that he has, his loyalty lies only with me, Alexander explained. So that's his story. He never seemed to tell anyone. Alina said. Can't blame him. If we hadn't seen the wonders of uncle firsthand, we also would have taken it as a lie, Lyanna interjected. Knock knock. They looked at the door. Alexander smiled and spoke. Come in Dobby. As Dobby walked in, he introduced him. Meet my right hand, Dobby the free elf. He's been with me for quite some time now. He's very powerful and also had magical powers. There are 1000 of his people too, but they will not live with us. They have their own place owned by me. 200 of the elves are wolf sword. They wear golden masks and black clothes. They are extremely trained in fighting and commanding. They also have magic and are my subjects, my people. They will lead our army and navy from now on. Alexander said. But we don't have an army or navy, Benyon said. Soon we will. Now, did you do it Dobby? He asked. Yes boss, we can go now, Dobby answered. Where are we going uncle? Lyanna asked. Alexander smiled, just follow me. He took them to the deepest level of the now restored Stark Crypt. Stark Crypts were a really strange place. Only 10% of it was ever officially used. It was as big as the whole Winterfell and as deep as six levels. He had felt that there was something even under the sixth level but he couldn't find any way to go there, so he just gave up, for now. He had created a very big room in the sixth level and put it under Fidelius' charm and he was the only secret keeper. One part of it was the big treasury which also had tens of protection wards. Then there was the secret private area, with food and water for years. This was the place where they would be portkeyed if they were harmed. At level 6, Alexander stood in front of a wall. To him, there was a door but for others, nothing. He then vanished into the wall, surprising everyone. Alexander came back out and laughed at them. He went to Benyon and said something in his ear. There's a door for a secret room. Suddenly Benyon jumped when he saw the door. By the gods, there's a D. D he tried to speak. Why can't I say it? He scaredly asked. He then told them all about the door and they all saw it. This is a secrecy magic. I am the secret keeper and only I can tell someone about it. You can all talk to each other about it but not with someone who doesn't know it. For us, here is the door. To others, there's nothing. Let's go in now. 
He opened the door and they all entered a big hall. There were ten rooms, one big hall with TV and stuff, and two modern kitchens. Everything was modern. Not wanting to explain, he sent the information directly into their heads. This is our private area where we can come using our port keys. If someone who doesn't know the secret somehow comes here, they'll feel like they are standing in an endless dark room with no way of finding direction. But for us, this is the safest and most comfortable place in world. Welcome to the wolf's heaven, he said with wide arms. Then everyone went to explore and take rooms. They were fascinated by all the technology. Dobby just went to the big couch and turned the TV. Benyon went to explore Earth's music, Brandon and Ned went to the gun range accessible by adults only and checked out the new kind of weapons. Lyanna and Elia first checked out the rooms and then happily took a bath in modern bathrooms. Then they checked out the convenient kitchen. Though they didn't need to cook as many nanny bots were there. It was a glimpse of the future for them. That's what he's slowly going to turn the world into. All right guys, enough exploring. Let's go to the treasury. He said and led them to another big room. There was a huge vault door on the wall. Alexander went close and put his hand on a screen beside the door. Soon the door automatically opened. Their jaws dropped from what they saw inside. Just calling it wealth was a disrespect. It was madness. The vault was huge and filled with gold and gems to the brim. This is what I am going to use to make new cities, armies, and stuff. Alina, you will learn accounting and management from Dobby. You can later hire some assistants for work. But only a seven can open this vault with our hands. I am also going to start many new big projects, he said. But what about men? We don't have enough people to work, Ned spoke. I'll take care of that soon. Let me remind you all. Winterfell will become the administrative center of all our major businesses and cities. This is from where we will control everything, so I am going to upgrade the city, Alexander informed them. He was going to make a big city with Greek and Roman architecture. After telling them how to use port keys to enter the wolf's heaven, they all went back to the castle to sleep. Alexander went to Fihame to check up on things. A month ago, he had ordered some godroids to use the two Helga Hufflepuff's cup to mass-produce butterbeer and fire whiskey. The cups couldn't be enlarged with magic but Doremon's big light did the job. Still, it could only be enlarged to one meter diameter. It was enough to produce 50 liters of drinking continuously. The butterbeer was packed in bottles to be shipped but the fire whiskey was sent to another room. The time cloth could be used to turn time forward or backward but it could not be enlarged with the big light. Magic did the work this time. The fire whiskey was aged 50 years using it and then packed in pretty looking bottles. He was sure that it'd be much more popular than the most expensive drink of West Arrows, Arbor Gold. Alexander walked towards the big castle. But he stopped in his way as he heard some ruckus coming from the pool. He went to check out and found a party going on with music. Medusa, Monty the Hippogriff, Barry the Phoenix and many more unicorns were chilling in the pool and bathing in the sunlight. Medusa probably had seen too many TV shows and movies that he copied from his memory. She was sitting on an inflatable duck and sipping on some drinks and big sunglasses on. When she saw Alexander she jumped out and ran to hug him. Grand Paea, join us, she excitedly said. Haha, you're having fun. What about your studies? He asked. Oh, I've already mastered it all. It's boring now, she said. Did you meet Grandpa Ragnarok on Drachium? He asked. Yes, he's so nice. He can also become human like me. We both travel around and beat some new bad dragons, she said. New dragons? Wait, the memory is coming. Then Alexander remembered that he had taken away all the dragons from the world after the doom of Valeria. But that was so much in the past and it seems that the new dragons have been here for not that long. Ah, uh, time and space is so weird. I'll visit him too, I'll ask him if he wants to go out with me to the new world, he said. I also want to go, she requested with big pleading eyes. Alexander quickly gave her the knowledge of the world of Game of Thrones. Wow, it's so bad. I don't want to go there anymore. Maybe once or twice, but I like it here more. Monty is here too her enthusiasm died down. Alexander ruffled her hair, haha. You can come to Winterfell anytime you want. You will like the children there. Okay, bye. Have fun. Chapter 55, 55. Ragnarok is here. He entered his castle and was first greeted by Alfred the AI. He was not just a computer now. He had a walking body. Though his main body still resided in the castle. He now uses the metal robot to explore things. Hey, Alfred. How's it going? He asked. Everything's good, boss. I've made the changes you wanted me to make on your Yamato warships with the help of blacksmiths and rune masters. It now runs on hydrogen engine that you designed. It also has a hydrogen production facility in it for self-sustenance. All the guns have been changed to advanced ones. With so much extra room, I made more crew quarters and also worked on increasing its speed. The ship can now go as fast as 150 nautical miles per hour, 277 kmph. Dot. Alfred said, Awesome, Alfred. These were just the steel warships. I want you to do the same with all the ships I brought with me. The common ships of my fleet will not have any modern technology so I want all the commanding ships to be good. He instructed. It will be done in a week boss, Alfred said and left to work. Then Alexander went to the brewery slash Hufflepuff cup multiplier room. There was no human elf there as the process didn't require anything complex. Some nanny bots and godroids were able to do it nicely. The elves were currently very busy creating a bull version of Hufflepuff with the help of the research material they received from him. 
He checked out and saw that the Hufflepuff cup also had some time difference in making different beverages. For example, multiplying 50 liters of butterbeer from one small drop only took 5 minutes but fire whiskey took 15 minutes. Currently, they have 12,000 bottles of butterbeer and 5,000 bottles of fire whiskey sitting in cold storage. He had ordered for a stock of 50,000 to be maintained. At first, he had the idea that the cup might be able to multiply a 50-year-old fire whiskey as it was, but he was wrong, the cup could not replicate the effect of time. Still, it was going nice. He was going to introduce these new beverages in the upcoming Northern Lords meeting. After checking that out he left to Drachium. He went directly to the mountain of Ragnarok. He went into the largest cave and found Ragnarok in his human form. Sitting on a chair and teaching another young dragon something. Ragnarok looked very old and had long white messy hair. His face also had a battle scar, which honestly speaking made him look badass. You can see the human Ragnarok on illustration channel of my discord, https colon slash slash discord dot gg slash dghcron. Or see them on Instagram https colon slash slash www.instagram.com slash mr underscore immortal underscore novel. Hey, Ragnarok. How have you been? He asked. Haha, nice to meet you again, Sir Ragnarok respectfully said. Oh come on. Call me by my name. Alexander or Alex. The current world I am in is a medieval society and calls me Lord Stark. Okay then. Alex is what I'll call you. But in public I'll still call you boss, like Dobby, Ragnarok said. I can agree to that. So, how's everything here? How are the new dragons doing? He asked. Everything is good. I have established a law system and divided the territory under governors. I'm trying to make them civilized. The new dragons had problems but everything is good now. He answered. Tell me if you need any help, my friend, Alexander offered. Then he looked at the dragon near them. He looked no older than three years. Three times bigger than a horse. His eyes looked intelligent. Alexander felt like he had seen him. Dexter, is that you? He asked. Haha, here I thought that you forgot. Nice to meet you again grandpa. Or I should say mommy. Dexter said. Alexander suddenly enlarged himself and gave him a tight hug. Acting like a big man are you, huh? How are you? How are Belina, Bobby, and Bunty? He asked. They are fine. Mom has found a new partner, some new dragon called Bale Ryan, the Black Dread. Bobby and Bunty are dumb as always. I came here to learn from the old man Ragnarok. After seeing my talent, he decided to make me his prime minister. Dexter said in his draconic tongue. Wow, you really climbed the social ladder fast. Good for you lad, I am happy for you. Here, take this book as my gift. It has 1000 problems and answers that you might face while administrating. He said and gave him a big book. Dexter's eyes show with excitement and quickly went to study it. Haha, <laughs> he's a very good kid. Ragnarok said proudly. So, you've made a prime minister. Are you thinking of retiring, my friend? Alexander asked. Ragnarok shook his head. No, I was getting bored. I had spent so many years resting before. Now I wanna explore. I was hoping you might take me to the medieval world you were talking about. Alexander thought for a bit. Now that you say it. Yes, I can and I might have a job for you too. I want you to keep an eye on a little girl. Let me give you all the knowledge of that world and the girl I'm talking about. Alexander then sent the information to his brain with the information about the life of Daenerys Targaryen. Poor girl indeed, Ragnarok interjected. Yes, but I don't want you to spoil her. I want you to make sure that she doesn't stray. Her brother also abused her and brainwashed her in the future and I don't want that to happen. I want her to become a good leader without the crazy ambition of becoming the queen. You should go and become a father figure for her. She's still very small you know, Alexander suggested. An interesting mission indeed. I'll do it. Ragnarok enthusiastically agreed. Good, let's go then, Alexander said and left the pocket dimension. They both appeared in Wolf's Heaven and from there he let Ragnarok travel alone. He was going to find a house with a red door and a lemon tree in Bravus. It was still very early so he decided to have a talk with Dobby about the weird black coin that he found in his pocket dimension. Alexander minimized calling Dobby like a house elf if not an emergency. Dobby was still in Wolf's Heaven, watching TV. Hey, Dobby, what's this black coin? He asked, fiddling with the coin. Dobby turned his head to look at the coin. Oh, it's your ownership coin. Ownership of what? Alexander asked. The Iron Bank, Dobby nonchalantly replied. Alexander's jaw fell. What, I own the biggest bank slash strongest organization in this world. Come on boss, you are way richer than them. Dobby said. Still, why didn't you tell me earlier? He asked. Because you didn't ask. And before you question. I told you about where to get the ships because if I didn't, it would have created a problem in your work, but not telling you about Iron Bank wouldn't have caused a problem. God only made the weird amnesia because he wants you to have fun, not cause trouble in your work. Dobby explained. So if someday I need to know something that is valuable to my work, you'll tell me? He asked. Yes, I will. Good, that's all I ask for. I don't want anyone to die because father wants me to have fun, Alexander said. Still, owning the Iron Bank changes so many things. He didn't really need to actively fight and take over the Seven Kingdoms now. He could just put them under crippling debt from the Iron Bank. When the time's right, he'll make the banker call the debts. Lords will not be able to pay it and then he'll force them to put their right to their lands as collateral for more time. 
Soon, he'll own everything through the Iron Bank. I need to pay a visit to Iron Bank, soon. But first, I need people. I should also take over the Citadel too. Those old arrogant men have kept the knowledge to themselves to keep themselves in a powerful position. I'm going to make all of them start a big college here in the north and teach everyone. From simple math to complex smithying. In fact, I should just burn the citadel down and make a new one here. Currently, Alexander was planning on quickly making the most essential big structures near Winterfell as the population was very low and easy to manipulate. He was going to create a new tower of knowledge, the new citadel, in the center of the new winter city. It was going to be nearly 650 feet high, 200 meters, with 65 floors. The first 10 floors would be schools and colleges for everyday use. The rest of it would be the main citadel where people can do their masteries. The building was going to be massive. It would have a hexagonal shape. 60 floors were divided into the level of mastery. 10 to 20, novice, training acolyte. 21 to 30, intermediate, acolyte. 31 to 40, advanced, becoming a maester. 41 to 50, superior, becoming an archmaester. 51 to 60, distinguished, becoming a grand maester. Each floor would have its own library with books matching the level. 6165 was going to have his personal floor and also a hotel slash restaurant for visiting nobles to spend money on. On top of the tower was a covered burning fireplace which would never go out. The basement of the tower also consists of 10 underground floors. One floor totally dedicated for printing press, another printing press was going to be made in Stark crypts. At the lowest level were the hydrogen generators which would power the tower. The tower would not have many windows and mostly look like a giant stone pillar. Only the top five floors had big windows to enjoy the view. There would be many elevators too. He was also planning to build a big administration building for new offices but he was going to let normal people make it. He would also build a new city from scratch, with big buildings, shopping districts, housing districts, police stations in Roman and Greek style. Water would be pumped through pipes to all homes and places. He was also going to install some street lights but with charms that would make people think that it was a normal thing. Chapter 56, 56. Oaths. All the lords were invited to the newly furnished and upgraded meeting hall. At the end of the hall was a big long white marble table for the Starks to sit and in front of them were various long tables and chairs of high quality. When the lords entered, they were surprised by the grandeur and beauty of the hall. The beautiful Stark banners on the wall. Wolf sculptures here and there made it look like they were really in a wolf's den. They all found a place and sat down. Soon, Alexander, Brandon, Ned, and Benyon entered the hall from a different entrance near their table. As soon as they all saw Alexander enter the hall, they all stood up. He went and sat down in the middle and the biggest seat, on his right sat Brandon and Benyon, and on his left sat Ned, Dobby, and Maester Lewin. Poor Maester Lewin had no idea that the citadel was going to be destroyed soon. Thank you for coming here my lords. We'll start the meeting soon but let's enjoy the house Stark's new drinks first. He said and soon many servants came in. Butterbeer was served with large glasses and the fire whiskey was served in small shots in shot glasses. A butterbeer bottle was given to all of them and fire whiskey for four people a bottle. Suddenly Great Yon Umber stood up with his shot glass filled with fire whiskey and roared, to Lord Stark. Everyone raised their glasses and downed them in one go, many of them started to cough after it. The fire whiskey was a strong drink, it gives a burning sensation for a while and then leaves behind warmth all over the body and it was aged 50 years with time cloth so its potency was even greater. It tasted a little spicy too. This. This is amazing my lord. This is a drink fitting for the north. Great Yon spoke in excitement. Thank you Lord Umber. I'll gift all of you one box of fire whiskey. Now, let's try the butterbeer, Alexander said. They tried the butterbeer and felt the sweetness and amazing smoothness of the beer. It left behind a sweet aftertaste. Such fine creations, may I know who made them my lord. Lord William Dustin spoke. William Dustin was supposed to die at Tower of Joy originally but he was one of the people whose fate Alexander changed. You are looking at him, Lord Dustin, Alexander said. William Dustin suddenly stood up and rushed to Alexander's table and kneeled. Such fine creation is enough to convince me that you are the best lord the north can have. I, Lord William Dustin of House Dustin, promise on my faith that I will in the future be faithful to Lord Stark of House Stark, never cause him harm, and will observe my homage to him completely against all persons in good faith and without deceit. I swear it by the old gods and the new. The sudden oath of fealty came off too suddenly. Lord Dustin had a great love for alcohol, which was pretty clear now. Ha ha ha, and I vow that you shall always have a place by my hearth, and meat, and mead at my table. And I pledge to ask no service of you that might bring you dishonor. I swear it by the old gods and the new. Arise. Alexander replied. Thank you, Lord Dustin. I can't give you the recipe for these two drinks but I can surely give you the recipe of another worthy drink. It's called vodka, I have a small batch of it, you all can try some. Then the servants brought bottles of vodka and poured it in shot glasses. This time Alexander stood up for the toast. For the prosperity of the north. For the north they all roared and drank. Once again, many of them coughed. This is perfect, my lord. Not as flavored and unique as fire whiskey and butterbeer but still very strong and impacting. I can see it liked by people in the north. Especially in the cold winter. Then it's a good thing it's always cold here, Great Yon spoke again. Haha, ha. 
Yes, this drink is not as costly to produce so I can see many small folks enjoying it too. Lord Dustin, please send a blacksmith of yours to my workshop to learn how to make various tools for making vodka. Alexander instructed. William nodded and looked at his aide to go and get the job done. Then Alexander got back to serious business. Okay, now to the main business. But, let's get over with the oaths first, that is if none of you have any objection on me becoming your liege lord. As expected, Ruse Bolton stood up. My lord, I am confused. You are not the closest in the line of succession to the... His words were interrupted by Gratian. Gratian was a firm supporter of the Starks no matter what. It was his son who was dumb. What nonsense are you blabbering Ruse, he said loudly. Please let him speak, Lord Umber. Everyone has their right to speak here, Alexander said. Ruse Bolton continued in his cold plain voice, My lord, what I am asking is, why are Lord Ricard Stark's sons not taking the lordship? His question was a genuine one. Many others also had the same question. Then Brandon stood up. Haha, I think I should answer your question, Lord Bolton. I am sure that many of you have heard the recent rumors. Claiming that our dear uncle here has forcefully taken the lordship from us with some trickery. They are all bullshit. I owe my life to uncle, he came to the damned king's landing all alone with Ser Davi to save me. He not only saved me but also saved the small folks from those Lannisters. I saw how the people looked at uncle there. They had true respect in their eyes. I knew at that moment that he could be a better lord than me. We all know that I have more muscles than brains and that is not a good thing for a lord, even less when he's the lord paramount. But uncle has more brains and muscle than anyone in this room, so I surrendered my lordship. Brandon sat down after saying that. Alexander had the urge to clap for him but controlled himself. But then he heard a faint clapping from behind his chair. He looked and found little Rena hiding there. She suddenly realized that she was caught and tried to run away but Alexander caught her in his arms and tickled her. Her cheerful laughter brought the room's mood to normal and everyone smiled. Rena then looked at his face while sitting on his lap. Sowie she knew she should have not entered the hall without permission. Haha. <laughs> and you are forgiven. You should not sneak around places like this. If you wanted to come, you should have just asked me. Okay, let me introduce you now. Everyone, meet the lovely little lady, Rena. I saved her and her mother from robbers. She and I have really kicked off well. I never had children, so I treat all children like my children. Alexander said. Yes, I never had children. I had demons. Oh, Uncle Redbeard, Rena exclaimed, pointing at Lord Dustin. He was with them on the ship back home. Haha. <laughs> yes, it's me little Rena. He laughed loudly. Okay, Rena. We are having a serious discussion here. Why don't you go and play with Eric, Rob, and John? He said. Rena quickly got down from his lap and ran back to play with the little ones. Ned stood up and started speaking, after Brandon, the lordship fell to me and I also rejected it. The reason is simple, I spent most of my life in Vale. I have no experience in dealing with northern matters. Uncle, on the other hand, has been here all this time. He's even managed to convince the wildlings not to attack, except some cannibal tribes. He's the best Starks can offer you all. Then it was Benyon's turn to speak but he never spoke. Alexander turned his head and found him happily drinking butterbeer. When Benyon noticed that everyone was looking at him, he said, What? I'm the third son, I never even had the chance to become the lord. And even if it did, I don't want it. I am happy as I am. Then he poured another glass for himself. Alexander laughed seeing that and said, There, you have the reason. Now let's get this over with. One by one, they all swore fealty. He looked into Ruse Bolton's head. The guy had wished to become the new warden and paramount of the north by any means possible. They were also flaying men in their dungeons. Well, I'll deal with you soon. For now, I don't want any infighting he said to himself. After they were done, he announced his plans. My lords, I am going to start some new projects for the north in the future. They are related to mining and some other things. The plans are still in the initial stage but I can guarantee that they will bring immense wealth to us all. I'll prepare a plan for prosperity for each of your houses and visit each of you personally in the near future to discuss them. Till then, I ask you to focus on as much food production as possible. I have found some much more productive ways of growing food that can not only make us self-sufficient but also leave extra. When you leave, I'll give each of you some equipment and someone will show you how to use it. With it, we can make hard soil soft and grow food, he said. Then he went on to explain to them about crop rotation and its benefits. Also the use of animal dung as fertilizers. They were all skeptical about it but a slight use of magic made sure they wholeheartedly did it. Another charm made sure that they understood not to reveal the methods so soon. Still, even if they did, nothing would change as the main reason for the soon-to-be crazy crop growth would be Alexander's magic. With this, I conclude the meeting. Let's have some food now, Alexander said. Tens of servants brought food on trolleys and prepared the tables. Most of the food was normal, with various kinds of meat and better wine. It's just the method of cooking and various spices used in making them were different. Alexander had made a humanoid nanny bot and made it in charge of the kitchen. The bot knew all the dishes possible and could even quickly grab stuff from his pocket dimension if needed. The whole hall erupted in loud chewing sounds and praises for the tasty food. After that, just as promised, he gave them all a crate of butterbeer and fire whiskey as promised. Now all he needed to wait for the night and travel the whole north on his magic carpet he just made. 
he was going to make the whole north fertile for all kinds of seeds. He was also going to meet his free folk friends and tell them about his offer. Chapter 57, 57. The Flying Carpet. The night came. Alexander, Dobby, and cute little Rena got on the flying carpet. Benyon had also come with them as he was the only one free. Others had their wives or little babies to care for. All right, welcome to our universe. We're going to fly all over the north and make the soil fertile. Then we'll go and have a chat with the free folks. Are you ready? Alexander said. Yeah, 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 yeah. only Rena shouted. Come on guys, show some enthusiasm. At least you should, Benyon. We're about to fly. Again, are we ready? Yeah, 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 yeah. this time everyone shouted. All right then. Alexander also sat down. There were some cylindrical pillows and a small short-legged table in the center, on which there were some drinks and milkshakes for Rena. The carpet moved upward and then started to go forward. There was wind resistance and an invisible wall around it but, he also let enough wind enter to give them a feeling of flying. Their first stop was House Umber. They were one of the closest to the wall. There were also some mountain ranges there. Alexander flew around it and did his magic. He made the ground very fertile and pulled a lot of silver and iron from deep under the mountains. He wasn't going to give too many gold mines as that would be counterproductive. Then he went to Karstarks and did the same to their land and gave them some small gold mines and a major iron mine. Arg, the Boltons. I hate them, scheming bastards. Do we really have to help them? Benyon said in disgust. I know how you feel and I also don't want to help them either, but if they are the only ones who didn't get anything, they would start making trouble. Besides, it's the small folks I'm worried about. I don't want them to face hunger. Alexander explained. House Bolton, now they were a special case. Even though House Umber and House Karstark were involved in the Battle of Bastards in the future, they weren't originally defiant. They were loyal to the Starks. But House Bolton had a history of rebellion, they were ambitious and wanted to rule north since the creation of their house. Hence, Alexander only made enough land fertile to fulfill their food requirements and also gave them a low-quality iron mine. They would most probably not even have enough small folks to mine them as he was planning on stealing them. Then he went to House Flint of Widow's Watch, Hornwood, and Woolfield, made their lands fertile and gave them small silver mines. Their land was mostly plain so he made it fertile to grow fruits as well. He also had another motive to be there. He was going to make Ramsgate the biggest trading city in the world. A new branch of Iron Bank would also be opened there. It would also have the headquarters of the Northern Navy and would be heavily connected with the rest of the world by sea and by land with the help of railways, which he was not planning on making any time soon. First, he needed to make good roads for big carriages. According to him, there were three types of cities. One Tier 1, with a population of 100,000 or less. 2 Tier 2, with a population of more than 100,000 and less than 400,000. 3 Tier 3, with a population of or more than 500,000. He was going to create Tier 4 megacities, with a population of more than a million. That would need a lot of planning and money. Plans were ready and he also had money. What he needed now was people, which would soon arrive as well. To make the other lords not sniff around him, he was also going to visit the Iron Bank in the name of taking a large loan. Then he flew to House Manderley. They were already one of the richest houses in the north as they had the biggest city and port in the north called White Harbor. The Manderleys loved sailing in seas but lacked ships. He made their lands fertile and also gave them an iron mine which would be used when he gives the designs for the new ships. Wow, big city. So pretty Rena jumped in excitement. At night the city looked quite big with its torches lit. Any city looked good from the sky. The smelly King's Landing too. Speaking of King's Landing, the latest news was that Robert had stayed away from prostitutes and seriously started ruling, but Alexander still wasn't sure as Robert had agreed to wed Cersei Lannister for the gold. Yes, Rena. But soon we will have an even prettier city near our home, Alexander said while caressing her hair. Then they flew across the whole north, circling the swampland of House Reed. It really pained him to see them living in such harsh conditions. They were very loyal to House Stark and yet were made fun of for their attire, eating frogs, and whatever they could find. Northerners called them bog devils or frog eaters. Even their villages are made on artificial islands made out of logs and move around in the swamp and bogs of the neck. Even the Greywater Watch, the seat of House Reed moves around and has no fixed address, hence no ravens can reach them and no maester is appointed to them. Alexander didn't know what to give them. They didn't have land for him to make them fertile or mountains to make mines. Then he had an idea. All right guys, we're gonna sleep here tonight. Right on this carpet in the air. Tomorrow we'll meet Lord Reed and give him a gift, Alexander said, looking at the sleepy eyes of Rena. What? But can't we just go back and return later? Benyon asked. This is an outing, my boy. The whole point is to stay out. Now go to sleep, Alexander said as the carpet expanded. They all slept the night under the starry sky. The next morning, Alexander woke up to a little foot planted on his face. He lightly laughed, most people would fear him if they knew his identity but here she was. Happily sleeping, without a care in the world. The sun had started to rise. Dobby was surprisingly missing and Benyon was snoring. Alexander slowly stood up to not disturb Rena and walked to Benyon. He was going to wake him up lightly but changed his mind when he heard Benyon sleep talking. Ho ho. Hey. Pretty lady. Alexander used his mind art to change the beautiful lady in his dream to woman version of Fat Mace Tyrell. Benyon suddenly woke up with beads of sweat on his face and furrowed brows. 
Alexander couldn't hold his laughter seeing that. So, how was it? Humping Mace Tyrell. Alexander asked, still laughing. For those who don't know Mace Tyrell Discord, https colon slash slash discord dot gg slash dghcron. Or see them on Instagram https colon slash slash www dot instagram dot com slash mr underscore immortal underscore novel. It was you? Arg, I don't think I'll even touch a woman for some days now, he said with a horror-filled face. Then Alexander went to wake Rena up. Hey there sweetie, it's morning already, he softly said. Triple A. Just a little more, she said, still half asleep. Oh, too bad, you'll not be able to see the unicorn then, Alexander said as he made a unicorn patroness. Rena quickly jumped up from her sleep with eyes wide open. She looked at the unicorn and started dancing around it. Then she went to touch it but the unicorn ran away. No, please don't go, she called out. Oh, unicorns are very shy creatures, Rena. But don't worry, I'll take you to see friendly unicorns later he promised. Now let's eat and go meet Lord Reed, Alexander said. He gave them simple egg rice, which they seemed to enjoy greatly. Rice was a new thing for them. Dobby then returned and sat with them to eat some. Where were you, Dobby? Alexander asked. I was checking the animals out. There are many weird ones in this world. Dobby said. Yeah, we'll probably find even more weird stuff when we go east. Alexander said. After they were done, they went down to the swamp and Alexander conjured a boat. No matter how many times I see magic, it always feels too good to be real, Benyon said and got onto the boat. Then they slowly rowed to the location of Greywater Watch. Finding it was not really hard when you looked for it from the sky. They soon arrived near the castle. Some Kranigmen pointed their arrows from the trees. Halt, how did you find this place? One of them asked. More like threatened to answer. Dobby the steel wall, stood up and shouted. Lower your bows. The is your liege Lord Alexander Stark, Lord of Winterfell. He has personally come to meet Lord Howland Reed. The men hastily lowered their bows and spoke in a polite tone. Please forgive us, Lord Stark. It's very rare to see people from other places find the castle. Please follow this light stream and you'll reach Greywater Watch. It's alright, you all are doing your duty. Here, I'm leaving this crate filled with new drinks. He said and magically a crate appeared near a guy. They all believed that they received it by Dobby's hand. Magic was convenient. Then they moved forward and arrived at the floating castle. It had a lot of overgrown plants here and there. There was some need for repair too. They were welcomed by some men at the main gate. He put Rena on his shoulders and walked into the castle. Lord Stark, what a surprise, though I am really shocked that you found us so easily without us ever noticing you Howland Reed came. Howland was just a bit older than Ned and was already the Lord of House Reed. Oh, come on son. No need for all this politeness with me. Just call me uncle like Ned. Alexander laughingly said. Howland and his people were a bit shocked by Alexander's relaxed manners. They were happy nonetheless. They already had enough troubles living, and now a great lord had come to whom they had to serve. They didn't have the money or resources to give a big welcome. Chapter 58, 58. Wanna ride an alligator? Their meeting became warm after they got relaxed. He introduced them to his party and Howland did the same. So, what do I owe the pleasure of your visit? He asked. Son, please don't take my words badly but I want you to forgive my predecessors for ignoring the neck and the house reed. You have been so loyal to us and yet we didn't do much for you. You are even mocked by the other northerners. Honestly, if it was me in your shoes I would have started a rebellion years ago. I want to change your life for the better, because when I see your land, I see opportunity, Alexander truthfully said. Howland Reed was surprised by the worlds of the elderly sitting in front of him, comparing him as of now with the one he saw in the throne room of Red Keep. There was an earth and sky difference. What opportunity, uncle? He asked. Haha, I have been able to procure lots of seeds for food crops that can grow in this swampland. Alexander said, the seeds would have grown even without making the soil fertile, but he still made the soil of the whole neck very fertile. Yes, look at these seeds. These are vegetables and fruits. This is rice and it can easily grow here. I'll also give you written recipes to make tasty dishes with them. You can even make enough to sell them to others. Alexander said as he showed the seeds or roots of rice, paddy, cassava, maize, fruits like cranberries, sweet potatoes, and coconut and vegetables like sea lavender, yam, cocoa yam, and pumpkin. There were enough varieties for them to never get bored. Then he taught them how to grow them and also about the time of harvesting. They will be having a bumper harvest of food in about three to four months. Cranberries would take much longer though. Alexander used his magic to imprint his instructions into their brains so they don't mess up and come to him to complain later. There's another thing I want you to do. I want to commission you to make a town near to King's Road. It will serve as your permanent trading outpost. It should be made above wood and bamboo pillars. Take this as this is a design for you. You can even open some food restaurant slash in there and serve your soon to grow specialties. Alexander said and handed them the designs. A guy from Howland's group looked at the design and spoke. Ingenious design. But it'll cost us a fortune to make, my lords. Oh, sorry, I forgot to give this to you, Alexander said and pulled out a big money bag from his large chest, which was always with them, according to the people in the room. Since I am commissioning you to make it, I should also supply the money. Here, 10,000 gold dragons should be enough for this small town, Alexander said. Howland looked at him. Who gives someone so much for nothing? 
My lord, H. How can we take this? He said, shooking his head. It's uncle and I don't think I am doing this for nothing. If you get rich, you'll pay more tax and that is good for me. On top of that, I've had great adventures in my younger days and have made a small fortune myself, so don't worry about it. This won't bankrupt me, haha Alexander smugly said. Says the guy who can turn any metal into gold Benyon and Dobby thought at the same time. In the end, Howland accepted the money. Then suddenly a guard barged in, my lord. They attacked again. Howland looked angered, Alexander asked, who attacked, my boy? He asked. It's not who, it's a what. There's a group of giant alligators, they've been attacking us for a long time now, he said. Why don't you domesticate them? Just imagine traveling by standing on their backs, Alexander said. They are wild beasts, uncle, Howland argued. Take me to them, he said. They reluctantly took him to the place where the alligators attacked. When Alexander went there, he sensed them and felt their minds. They were dumb and rage-filled beasts. So he changed their minds a little. It made them friendly to Kranigman and follow their commands after some training. There were about 2,000 giant alligators in the whole neck and he did it to all of them. Rena, wanna ride an alligator? He asked. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But what is Regator? She confusedly asked. Haha, look there. He pointed. A very big alligator headed straight to them. The man pointed their arrows at it. Don't shoot the arrow. It's not going to attack, he said. Soon the alligator came close to Alexander and looked at him for a while. Then it went to his feet and started licking them. Ha ha ha. Good boy. Come, Rena. He grabbed the hand of Rena and stood upon its back. The alligator moved in the water slowly with them standing on their backs. Rena was originally scared but in a matter of minutes started enjoying it. After turning some circles around, they returned. See, you can domesticate them, he said and gave them some fake secret language words. They would use it on the alligators themselves. After an hour everyone there had an alligator. Their house sigil was something alligator-like so they were very happy with having the new companion. Ha ha ha. So many gifts in a single day. I don't think I'll ever be able to repay you, he gratefully said. Ha ha. I am your liege lord. It's my duty to help you in times of need. Alexander patted his back. All right, we should leave now. There is a lot of work in Winterfell. I'll return when you complete the bamboo town and start selling your new delicacies, he said. Ha ha. You are always welcome here, my lord. Uncle, Howland said. After a while they were back on the flying carpet, making land fertile and creating some mines. They did it till they reached the wall. Truly a magical place. From there they flew across the wall into the wild north. He looked around and found the camp, but there was a skirmish going on around it. It seemed like they were getting attacked. They came down from the carpet at some distance and then took out their horses and donned their armor. They rode towards the camp. Alexander looked into a guy's mind and found out that they were being attacked by cannibals. He quickly sent Rena to Fahim to Medusa. He had told Medusa to take her to see a unicorn. Then he, Dobby, and Benyon joined the fight. With their addition, the fight didn't last long. They cut down all of the cannibals. Hormun, the leader of the small village welcomed him with a bear hug. Haha, great Lord Stark has come to help us now, he said. Well, someone had to come and save your ass, Alexander replied, changing his way of talking to match free folks. This is my nephew, Benyon, and you already know Dobby, Alexander introduced. Come, let's get something to drink he led them to a big tent. Why did they attack this village? I thought they didn't come this far, he asked. Hunger makes you do many things, my friend, Hormon replied. Wise words coming out of you. What did you do to Hormon? He joked. Yeah, yeah. So, what's with the sudden visit? And what about that king business? Hormon asked. I killed the king and also saved my other nephew. Now, I've become the lord of Winterfell and warden of the north. Alexander said. Hmm. Climbing the social ladder are you now? Hormon said with a large sip of alcohol. Wait, try this Alexander gave him a bottle of fire whiskey. Hormon drank some and his eyes widened. This. This is magic. Haha, <laughs> I knew you'd like it. How Stark makes it now, our brand new creation. Then I must ask you to sell me some. You can take whatever you want in return. Hormun said. Ha ha ha, I can sell it to you but only if you accept one request of mine. Alexander seriously said. Ask anything, my friend, Hormun said. I want all the non-cannibal free folks to move to Skagos. The harsh north is no place to live. You all have been living here because the wall didn't allow you to move south. Food is scarce here, most of the babies die even before their first names day. In Skagos, you'll have land to grow food and animals to herd. I'll also give you many ships to conduct trade. I've also found an iron and silver mine there. Alexander said, Did you forget that we don't kneel? Hormon angrily said, I don't remember telling you to bloody do so. All I said was to move to Skagos. Alexander also showed a slight anger. The best way to talk to a free folk was to do it like them. Hormon suddenly realized his mistake, Sorry, my friend. But I've heard that the sea around Skagos is violent and the island is also stony. That was true but Alexander would solve the problem. The sea was so violent because of the air current that used to get trapped between the northern mainland and Skagos tall mountains. He just needed to change the topography of the island to solve it. It was also inhabited by cannibals. Unicorns also supposedly lived there. That's just a hoax. Trust me, it's a nice, big island with enough pasture and jungle. If you agree, then tell other friendly tribes too. 
Alexander said, What about your other northern lords? Won't they object? Hormon countered. Last I remember, I was their liege lord. If they go against me, I'll deal with them in my own way, he firmly replied. Ha ha ha, I believe you. I'll send messengers to all friendly tribes. The giants are nice, they should come too, Hormon said. After that, they drank some more, and Alexander went out to find Benyon and Dobby. He found them talking to a giant, Mag the Mighty. Dobby was able to understand the big man but Benyon was clueless. Hello there, king of giants. It's nice to meet you. Hormon might want to talk to you. Alexander said. The giant nodded and walked away. To think that giants are still alive. We southerners are so ignorant, Benyon exclaimed. Haha, wait till you see the dragons in some years, Alexander said, shocking him even more. Then he went to Fahame to grab Rina. He found her happily playing with a baby unicorn. Loudly laughing when the unicorn licked her face. Ha ha ha. You've been having fun, I see Alexander came. Grandpa A.A. Look, his name is Rooney. He's so cute, she pointed to the baby unicorn. Alexander also walked up to them and caressed the baby unicorn. Ha ha. Yes, he's very cute. Okay, we're going home Rina. Your mother should be worried about you. He said. Already? But I wanted to play more, she sadly said. I can bring you here anytime you want, sweetie. Don't worry. Rooney will also be here the next time you come. Am I right Rooney? He said. The little unicorn nodded and licked Rina's face. Hee <laughs> hee. Okay, bye Rooney she hugged him and left with Alexander. Then they boarded the carpet again and returned to Winterfell. Chapter 59, 59, Tyrion Lannister. After returning, Alexander got busy with his Winterfell upgrades and Wintertone's expansion into Winter City. He was hoping for at least 500,000 people to live there. For the next two months, he worked on his building plan. He also electrified the whole Winterfell castle. The printing press was used to print posters asking all the jobless people to come to Winterfell. Alexander had put a slight notice me charm on them to make people notice it. His new citadel was also ready but was currently invisible, how was he going to explain it to people? Still, he had built up an illusion that would make people think that it was under construction. For now, he had told everyone that it was a food granary for the whole north. It was unbelievable but still, a bit of magic and it became believable. His next immediate agenda was, 1. Go to Old Town and take over the Order of Maesters. 2. Visit the Iron Bank and start plans to take over West Arrows. 3. Go to the legendary Cannibal Bay in the Shivering Sea and grab nearly a thousand wrecked ships. He was the most excited to choose option 3 first but controlled himself. But before leaving, he was going to start the plan to restore the Moat Kalin. It was a magnificent castle but also costly to maintain. He was going to connect the east and west coast via a great canal which would flow just beside Moat Kalin. It would probably help Moat Kalin establish a Moat City too. A slash N, here we have it. The most common thing in every GOT fanfiction. The canal. His smith elves will lead a team of builders that they have been training for months now to rebuild Moat Kalin. Alexander sat in the castle's new living area, which only Starks and contract signers could access. It was filled with modern technology, music boxes, and a large TV. He was watching TV with little Alexandra, Eric, John, and Rena. Caitlin didn't like leaving Rob with Alexander for some obvious reason. He also didn't let her come near John, who knows what that hateful woman would do to him if he left them alone. Tom and Jerry was the kid's favorite show. The concept of a mouse besting a cat was intriguing. Dobby, I'll be going away for a while. You'll be the administrator of the North in my stead. Alexander said to his close friend. You got it, boss, Dobby said while humming and listening a song through earphones. Alexander's interest got piqued and went to check. He took one earphone. He give it to me. Every day every day every day. Since when did you get into teen pop? And this song? He disgustfully asked. Oh come on boss, don't be too judgmental now, Dobby said. All right, all right. I won't judge. We all have different tastes. In sex, Alexander said with his hands up in the air in surrender. I am not G.A. Dobby said something but Alexander had already left by then. Having accomplished his goal of annoying Dobby. Across the narrow sea. A meeting was taking place between an old man and a small newly born girl. Ragnarok had found where the Targaryen family was living. A wealthy merchant had given them refuge. Sir Willem Derry, the king's guard, was a nice man to go to such lengths to save two children whose future didn't look very bright. Daenerys was very small currently. Probably a few weeks old. Alexander didn't save Rilla. She was a broken woman who had a lot of pent-up anger. She would have settled for nothing less than the throne for her kids. Unless he messed with her brain. He let her go to havens and rest in peace. Which is also why he couldn't bring himself to let the little Dany face extreme hardships. He wanted her to have a happy life while slowly moving forward. Ragnarok reached the door and knocked on it. A servant opened the door. He told her that he wanted to meet Ser Derry. The man had grown too old and also blinding. Who are you and what do you want? Willem irritatedly asked. I know about the kids, Ragnarok said. Willem's eyes widened and reached for his sword but without him even noticing there was already a sword resting on his throat. If I wanted to harm you or the kids, I'd already be on my way back home, Ragnarok added. W what do you want? He nervously asked. There's someone out there, extremely rich and powerful. He doesn't want little Dany to live a harsh life, so he sent me here to watch over her. Ragnarok replied. Tyrells. Willem guessed out loud. 
Haha, the Tyrells aren't even worth my boss's fingernail. So, what's it gonna be? How can I trust you? You don't. But you also don't have much of a choice either Ragnarok nonchalantly replied. All right, but I'll be keeping an eye on you. If you harm them, I'll kill you even if it costs my life, Willem strongly said. Sure, Ragnarok walked into the big house to see the little girl. And there she was, in a crib. So small and cute. Silver hair and purple eyes. Ragnarok took out a dragon plushie and showed it to her. She in return made happy noises and tried to grab it. Ragnarok lightly placed it beside her. So cute, Ragnarok exclaimed. Alexander was on his way to Old Town, with two of his wolf's swords, on a warhorse and his armor. While he traveled he hoped that many people would come and settle in the new winter city. The Moat Kalin will also probably be completed and the work for the megacity, named Norgold will be started. As it was going to be the biggest moneymaker city in the north slash world. His first stop was going to be Riverrun, then Casterly Rock, and finally Highgarden. From there, the old town is very close. He had no intention of meeting Hoster Tully, so he bypassed them and headed straight to the famed Casterly Rock. He also wanted to assess how much gold was left in their seemingly limitless gold-filled mine. It was currently the end of year 283 AC and the main story of the Game of Thrones started in AC 298. Fifteen years is a long time to change a lot of things and he was sure that many things would change because of his process. Many events might happen differently, but there was one thing that would still remain the same. That was the nature and attitude of the people. His small team rode towards the Westerlands. In their ways, they found some thieves but were easily neutralized. As soon as they entered the Westerlands the thieves became rare and rare. Westerland lords took security pretty seriously, he guessed. When they arrived at Lannysport, they were welcomed by a group of armed guards. It was obvious that their travel was no secret and the Lord of Casterly Rock wanted to show the might of Lannisters so he invited him to his castle. The Lord of Casterly Rock surprisingly came out with his small family to greet a small lord of a poor house like him. Alexander was still in full armor except for the helmet. His wolf sword guards also looked a bit scary with their red shining eyes under the masks. His attire made Tywin remember the scenes of the throne room. Haha, <laughs> I am truly overwhelmed to be personally received by you Lord Tywin. How are you? He spoke with a rather informal tone. No one had the guts to say anything to him. We don't receive many guests here, you are in luck that I was here, Tywin said in his disdainful voice. Alexander looked around, there were Kevin Lannisters and Jerrion Lannister, Tywin's younger brothers. Then there were Tyrion Lannister and Cersei Lannister, who was betrothed to Robert, and would probably give birth to a child soon. Alexander looked at the little Tyrion Lannister. Surprisingly he didn't look ugly. Then a memory resurfaced in his mind. Memory. Some years ago, Alexander was flying over Casterly Rock and saw a little boy crying alone under a tree. Alexander got interested and went to see him. What happened, boy? Why are you crying? He asked. Five-year-old Tyrion Lannister looked at him with teary eyes. His face was really deformed. His head was bigger, teeth were crooked. Mismatched eyes and curved legs. Dragons are dead. I can never see them ever again. I just wanted a little on. Just like me. He cried. Do you want to see a dragon? He asked. The boy nodded his head. Alexander pointed his finger and a small moving dragon materialized in front of Tyrion. He looked shocked and happy. Can I touch it? He longingly asked, to which Alexander nodded. Tyrion then happily played with the little dragon for a while and fell asleep after getting tired. While asleep, Alexander removed all the disfigurement and made him look like a decent person. He was still a dwarf though. Then he left a small dragon figure toy beside him. I'll see you later, child, Alexander softly said and flew away. Memory end. So, that's why he looks different chapter 60, 60. Citadel. They invited him for dinner and gave him an abode for the night. He happily accepted it. The only person he felt irritated with was Cersei. The girl had so much hate in her that he could feel it even from meters away. The only person she really loves is probably her brother. Even that, in the wrong way. Tyrion was quite scared of him in the beginning but soon came close when he started talking about his adventures north of the wall with his favorite uncle Jerrion. Seriously? Giants are still alive? Jerrion exclaimed, while taking a sip of wine. Absolutely. I was north of the wall before starting this journey. They have a whole tribe living there. Not just that, they ride giant mammoths. But they still can't break the wall, Alexander said. For some reason, Cersei took a sigh of relief. She mostly disdained the northerners and thought of them as barbarians but even she accepted that they protected the rest of the realm from wildlings and now these giants. The wall was a blessing. Ha ha ha. I might really have to make a trip there then. Jerrion laughed. Tyrion felt jealous of his uncle. He also wanted to grow quickly and go on adventures. Well, if you go there, go to Hormon's tribe. We have good relations with them, Alexander advised. If I remember correctly, I still have a long tooth of a winter lion. They are very huge and have long teeth, Alexander added while looking into his pouch. He took out a big tooth, the poor guy attacked me. I took his tooth and let him go away, he said and gave it to Tyrion. Here, you can keep it, son. Tyrion was very surprised but nonetheless happy. T thank you, Lord Stark. Haha. <laughs> Call me grandpa, you are still too young to do lord this and that, Alexander joked and ruffled his hair. Except Tywin and Cersei, everyone looked happy seeing the smiling Tyrion. After dinner, he retired to his allocated room. 
At midnight, he turned himself invisible and cast a silent charm. He also put a fake body in the bed. His stop was the mines under the castle. The castle was seriously huge and the cliff on which it was situated was supposed to be even taller than the wall. No wonder their gold never seems to ever end. You can see the Casterly Rock on illustration channel of my Discord, https colon slash slash discord dot gg slash dghcron. Or see them on Instagram https colon slash slash www.instagram.com slash Mr. Underscore Immortal Underscore Novel. Alexander entered the underground mines and surveyed them. He was surprised to find the lack of men working. His final conclusion was that the Lannisters were going broke. Their gold would probably last another 10 years. Let's make that eight as Alexander helped them a bit. He was going to give the money to Iron Bank and then loan it back to Lannisters. 6,000 years of mining finally made the Golden Lion rust. He was aware of the Lannister pride so Tywin would surely take loans from Iron Bank in the future. The next day, he left for the Old Town. He felt quite happy that he came to Casterly Rock as Tyrion really liked him now. The boy was even shouting goodbye from the castle till they disappeared from his vision. His next stop was Highgarden. He personally didn't like them. They were cowards and opportunists and still acted like brave men. On top of that, their family was messed up too. Only the old Olena Tyrell had some brain. Her son, Mace Tyrell, Lord of the Highgarden had a walnut for a brain, Mace's son, Eldest Willis got his legs injured because he was forced to participate in a tourney at a young age. Alexander also bypassed Highgarden and went straight to Old Town. He didn't have time to waste on fools. Reach might be the one selling food to the north, for now, that too at a higher price. But that was going to change soon. Two more months and the harvest begins. We'll see what the Tyrells will do with their extra food then. Old Town was a very big and the oldest city in West Eros. The seat of the House Hightower and Citadel Headquarters. The buildings were connected with various bridges over the river, making it a giant hub of knowledge. Alexander straight up headed to the main building and asked for a meeting with the Conclave. Surprisingly, they agreed. Now he didn't have to go and find each of them, but he also had to wait for a week. He just booked a room in a high-end inn for a month and locked himself up. Then he operat to Winterfell to play with Rena. He really missed her. Behind the scenes, Alexander had told Dobby to send a box of fire whiskey to every great house in West Eros. They have already started receiving many more orders since then. A week later, an acolyte came to him to inform him of the meeting. Alexander went on time and knocked on the door. Lord Stark, it's a pleasure to meet you. Please take a seat, an archmaester said. Can you tell us the purpose of your visit? An archmaester who had mastery in mathematics spoke. Ah, yes yes. I wanted to see if all I've learned in my life is enough to earn me some links here. I want you all to ask me any questions and if I can't answer, I'll donate a hundred gold dragons to each wrong answer. If I can answer all of you, then I want you to give me unrestricted access to all parts of the citadel, he said. His claim was arrogant but the conclave was more greedy. Why are you doing this, Lord Stark? One of them asked. Because I'm bored, he said nonchalantly. The archmaesters felt disgraced so they decided to accept the offer and show this lord his place. The first to question was the archmaester of healing. He asked some dumb questions about the human body and how to treat some diseases. Then he asked how to treat Grayscale, thinking that Alexander would not have an answer. But Alexander gave him a full method of how to perform surgery on the skin, remove it and also heal it. But there's no proof that it will succeed. Archmaester retorted. There are thousands of written healing methods to treat Grayscale and none of them guarantee. Don't ask questions whose answer you don't know, Alexander replied, shutting the guy up. Then it was the Archmaester of Astrology and Stuff. As expected he answered flawlessly and also gave some more knowledge to them. The same was repeated with the others. They had shocked faces by the end of the meeting. They all were older than him but he had more knowledge than all of them combined. While they all were frowning and regretting accepting Alexander's offer, they were all going through a mind search by Alexander. Most of them were sinners. Planning and plotting was a normal thing. Their main agenda was to keep making the Lords of West Eros feel a requirement to have a maester. For example, they were the only people who knew Ravenry. On top of that, the education was so unpromoted that many lords directly allowed their maesters to read letters for them as the lords didn't know how to. They also liked little children, they were easy to scare and control, hence the best targets for old men. Well, he was also going to castrate them. Three of them deserved death and the rest deserved time torture. Even Archmaester Marwyn had dabbed in some blood rituals during his travels in Asahi. But he also found an interesting thing about him. He swiftly gave them time torture and made them loyal to him. These men were no good left alone. Killing them would be a waste before they passed on their knowledge. Those who didn't deserve to die were compelled to sign a magic contract. Archmaester Marwyn was an old man who had spent his whole life in search and study of higher powers like magic. There was also a reason for his drive to learn magic. There was a time when he had a happy family. He had a wife and a lovely daughter. The problem came when he found out that his daughter had a bone disease. Her bones were growing weak and soon she won't be able to walk. He asked many healers. Many ignored him and those that did help him said that she was untreatable. That's when he turned to magic. He had heard that there was magic in the east that could do miracles. So, he left all his savings to his family and went away. He was disappointed though. He found out that most of the magic he could learn there was for doing bad things. 
But he still didn't give up and kept on learning and experimenting. When he again found himself lost, he decided to go to Old Town and search in the biggest library in the world. To read the most secret books he had to rise up in the ranks and become an archmaester. However, disappointment was what he found there too. There was no book that had knowledge of magical healing in it. He wanted to go home and see his precious daughter again but decided against it. The pay of an archmaester was good, also, his wife and daughter were a secret. He could make his wife and daughter's life better this way too. His daughter had also grown past her marriage age so he had to take care of her or at least leave enough money behind. But here he was, sitting in front of probably the most knowledgeable person alive. He had also asked some easy questions about magic but surprisingly he received an answer even better than he expected. It was like the man really knew how to do it. Then he felt a slight magical aura in the man. He could feel that it was suppressed. Normal people could not feel it, but he could. To him, Alexander looked like a ray of light in his moment of hopelessness. His suspicion was confirmed when he saw other archmaesters agree to his terms. There was also that contract that he made everyone except him sign. I need to talk to him, alone he thought. Chapter 61, 61. The Iron Bank. After the meeting was done Alexander went to copy all the books in the Citadel. He was going to need them in his Tower of Knowledge. He cast a wide area disillusionment charm and got to work. He copied every book and sent them to his pocket dimension. It took him a whole day to do that. Then it was time to explore. He checked out for any secret entrance. There was one he found that led to the basement. In the basement, he found many human and dragon skeletons. The earlier maester must have been interested in dragons. Then there was a vault. Cobwebs indicated that it wasn't opened in a long time. He entered and found many more books. Most of them were about different kinds of magic. Many were about water magic which was thought to have become extinct because of the bloody Valyrians and their dragons. The water magic belonged to Reuner that used to live beside the river Roin. The order of maesters must have been trying to rid the world of magic. So much good magic was lost and what's left behind is blood magic and dark magic which does more harm than good. Alexander took away all the books. Among the books was also a book for healing with water magic. Then there were also some rare old currencies and worthless things. After emptying the vault, he put lots of wildfire in there with an attached timer. It would explode in one year. All of West Arrows probably already knew that he was constructing a mighty tower, completing it in five months was crazy but still possible, as long as he used the right illusions. When he was going out of the Citadel, he saw Archmaester Marwyn waiting for him. Lord Stark, can I have a word with you? Marwyn spoke. Alexander smiled, already knowing what the old man wanted to talk about. Sure, Archmaester, UMM, not here. Can you come with me to my chamber? He requested. Sure, lead the way. They sat down in his chamber. Marwyn was continuously looking at some candles. Why are you looking at the candles with so much focus? Alexander asked. Oh, no nothing, Marwyn sounded sad. Haha, is this what you were expecting? Alexander interjected, and suddenly the candles started to burn at full intensity. Marwyn stood up in excitement her looked at the fire. P please teach me. Why? I I want to heal my daughter. Alexander smilingly said. How do you know that? Marwyn questioned. I know many things. Alexander jovially said. Who are you? He seriously asked. Alexander suddenly vanished and reappeared beside Marwyn. He put his hand on his shoulders and they both disappeared. The next time they appeared was in the Great Sept of Baylor in King's Landing. Marwyn quickly recognized the place. Alexander slowly walked to the biggest sculpture in the hall and stood beside it. The Sept of Baylor had the sculpture of the Seven, but there was another addition. The Seven sculpture stood on the palm of a hand. Alexander's sculpture was the biggest and stood behind the Seven with his one hand giving blessings and another missing, denoting that the other hand was making the world work. Now, tell me, do you recognize me? Marwyn suddenly got down to his knees and started praying. All Father, you are All Father, the King of all gods. His eyes started to tear up and started prostrating. Please, heal my daughter. I'm ready to give you anything in return. Please, I will heal your daughter. In return, all I ask for is service. I will teach you poti wondering and rune mastery. You will learn it and teach it in my school, Alexander said. He could give him magic, but what would be the point? Some random organization was able to do this much damage to the magical development of the world. What's the guarantee that it won't happen again? That is why the technology route was best. Anyone can learn it and make tech so there won't be anyone special. Yes, I'll do it. For as long as you want me to. Marwin quickly replied. Then sign this and follow me he gave a paper and a quill. Okay, let's go and heal your daughter now. They again vanished. They appeared in a small village, in front of a small farmhouse. Marwin excitedly entered without even knocking. Bam. He received a pan to his head. Thief. Thief. A woman started to scream. Hey. I am your husband, woman. It's me, Marwin, he shouted. Marwin. How? She looked at her husband on the ground and quickly hugged him. Oh, look how thin you've gotten. These years must have been hard on you, she cried. Father. Another frail woman came. This one, much younger. She was in a wheelchair, which probably Marwin designed. Myra. Marwin looked at her. Tears in his eyes. Father, you came back she cheerfully smiled. Yes. Yes, my sweetie. I also brought a healer. He says he can heal you completely. 
But, they said I can't be healed, she replied, with no happiness in her voice. She must have already lost all hope, Alexander thought. Alexander walked up to her. Drink this, child, he said with a warm smile. Marwin quickly forced her to drink it. Myra quickly drank the sour potion and started feeling warm. Just a potion would not have been enough to regrow her bones quickly, so he also used his magic to permanently heal her. With every passing second, they could see the changes happening to Myra. Her body was getting healthier and her skin was becoming better. Her thin legs started to develop some extra muscles. Gathering some courage, Myra tried to get up but stumbled. Haha, <laughs> it will take some time to get used to it. But your bones are healed now, Alexander said. Marwin quickly grabbed his daughter's leg to check. This. Thank you so much. His wife bowed to Alexander. It's fine. Marwin, I need to go, so let's talk somewhere else. Yes. Yes. Please Marwin took him to another room. When in private, Alexander told him about his task. I want you to send your family to Winter City. There are good houses and good work for even women. You will soon join them, but for now, you need to compile three types of books. One with basic knowledge of counting, biology, and history that children of 6 to 10 can understand. Second with more complex subjects for people between 11 to 15 and third for 17 to 20. Use any book you need in the Citadel and complete it in five months. Yes, I will complete this task. You can count on me, Marwin said. I should leave for the Iron Bank now. I've already spent a lot of my time he thought. Say goodbye to your family and when you're done with it. Touch this ring and say activate, it will take you back to your chamber in Citadel. It's only one use item, so you won't be able to come back. I need to go now, good luck with the work, he said. Next, he went back to the old town and hired a ship to get to Bravus. It would have taken him nearly two months but due to magical winds, they arrived there in two weeks. It was crazy, but the people on the ship had no other answers except calling it good wind. Bravus was a pretty nice place. Its population was more than King's Landing. Although slavery was banished, many forms of slavery were still present there. You can see Bravus on illustration channel of my Discord, https colon slash slash discord dot gg slash dghcron. Or see them on Instagram https colon slash slash www.instagram.com slash Mr. Underscore Immortal Underscore Novel. He walked towards the moon pool. The bank was just beside it. It was quite a nice tall building. He entered the bank and arranged a meeting with the management. He was a big lord from West Arrows so he was quickly allowed into a large hall with a big stone table at the end with three big seats, and in front of it were two benches. The setup would surely overwhelm any person. The person asking for money was given no big seat and sat lower. He also went and sat down on a bench. Soon, the big doors opened and three men in neat and clean clothes entered. They quickly took their seats and the middle one spoke. What can we do for you, Lord Stark? He asked. I was wondering, are you the most senior authority in the Iron Bank? Alexander asked. No, we are the second most senior authority. Above us are the elders. There are only five of them and they hold the most power, he answered. Hmm, you might want to call them after this. Alexander stood up and gave the middle one his black coin. Show this to your elders and tell them, he's back, Alexander said and sat back down with his legs crossed. The middle guy, who also looked pretty young, was surprised and shocked by the coin. I must tell father about this. If this is real, we'll lose everything the man thought, which Alexander also heard. We have a bad boy here. Magic it is then Alexander thought to himself. He used a compulsion charm to make him just go and tell the elders. The three went away for a while only to come back with five old men with one foot already in the grave. Alexander quickly mind sweeped and found that they all were quite corrupted. They all knew what the black coin meant but they just didn't want to give their power away. They had already sent someone to hire the faceless men to come and kill him. Hello, old people, I am also old but not to the point that I look like a wraith. As you've seen the coin. I am the owner of Iron Bank. So, are you going to surrender or fight? He straightforwardly asked. How do we know that it's not fake? One of them questioned. UMM. Isn't your job to know that? Anyway, if you were to go to a vault with a black door and use the coin to open it, it would open. Yeah, that's the key. Alexander said, surprising everyone. The vault with black door was the oldest vault in the Iron Bank and no one knew how to open it. Then one of them slowly walked forward and kneeled. He wasn't a guy from Iron Bank though. Valor Morghulis, the man calmly said. Haha. Valor Dohiris, my boy. Now get up and remove that dirty face, Alexander laughed. Jack and Hgar showed off his normal look, or normal mask. The faceless men were pretty different in this universe. As Alexander was the one who made them, they were not allowed to kill any child, or a good man or woman. As long as the person had committed some notable crimes they could kill. Good thing they lived in a world where most rich people had done something bad and they were always the one to hire them against someone like them. You. We hired you to kill him. Why are you kneeling to him? The elders shouted. Alexander then removed the memories of the five old men and the three accountant and made them loyal to him. They all had their hands bloody by investing in slavery, which he despised. They would surely die, but only after they pass over their knowledge and responsibilities. Alexander assigned five wolf swords in disguise. The five old men would choose them as their replacements. Follow me Jaken. Let's go to your temple, Alexander said. It's your temple, all father, Jaken replied. Ha ha ha. I guess it is he laughed. 
Chapter 62, 62, Progress Report. He went through a nice tour of the house of black and white. It was creepy. They had a huge statue of him in a hall, to whom they prayed to. Before leaving, he gave them his modified uniphone. There was no magic in the air to create connectivity though. There were no signals on the phone yet, but soon there would be. He had a mecha maker from Dora Eamon. He just needed to design it and put some metal in the machine. The satellite can be made in probably minutes. Putting it in orbit was easy too. He was also interested in looking at the planet from space and also finding out the reason behind its weird season cycle. Being done with his work in Bravus, Alexander hired a ship back to White Harbor. He paid a lot of money to hire the ship for his personal travel. When the news reaches other big lords they'd think that Alexander likes to spend money on lifestyle, even if the money is loaned. It will also make them think that they can buy him. When the ship started its week-long journey, Alexander decided to go to Cannibal's Bay. As he didn't know the location, he used the anywhere door. He opened the pink door and a gush of chilling air came. He quickly crossed it and closed it. He was greeted by a plain white sheet of white ice. He could feel that just some feet below him was the Shivering Sea. The legend has it that there's a part in the Shivering Sea where the sea freezes from time to time. By the time the ships turn around they find themselves trapped. In short, the place was a cold graveyard of ships with a cannibal population. He walked around and saw many ships but no people there, only skeletons. The whole world knew that going deep into the Shivering Sea was dangerous so no one really goes there anymore. Which would also mean that all the cannibals would have died by now. One by one, he started absorbing all the ships he could find. There was quite a good amount of gold too. In total, he found 1,100 ships. After that, he went inside his pocket dimension to Fihaim and started using Restoring Beam to make the ships usable again. But they were very old models so it wouldn't be very helpful in the seas. So, he used Deluxe Light, it turned the ships into a better version of themselves. This meant that he now had 1,100 common ships that would be the backbone of his navy. Each of these ships houses a crew of 41. He only needed 1,000 so he decided to give 50 out of the remaining 100 to Coast Guards. They would use it as their flagship. Their common ships were smaller than the navy. The remaining 50 were to be used for transport and trade for now. He created a lot of godroids as its temporary crew and told them to bring 100 ships to the new megacity Norgold, every three months. His wolf swords were already recruiting men on a large scale. They all were bounded by a contract to at least work five years. However, they could still complain if they didn't like something. Then he returned to his ship to White Harbor and enjoyed his trip. But, due to sudden great wind, the ship would only need three days to reach the destination. Once back in Winterfell, Alexander convened a Stark meeting. Alina was included in that category as well, she was a Stark in all but name. All right guys, what's the progress? I want reports. Alexander said. Their meeting took place in Stark's only living room. All the others sat in their seats in front of him. Alina spoke first, I was trying to count the coins in the treasury but just gave up after 10 million. However, I have put that 10 million aside as our main fund. It will give us a better sense of expenditure. I don't want us to become reckless thinking that we have infinite money. Haha. <laughs> Job very well done, my dear. We'll use the 10 million and multiply it with our efforts. Alexander praised. Then Dobby spoke, on my part, the repairing of Moat Kalin has been done. We also have built a small town with good planning. It can be easily expanded into a tier 3 city later. A long concrete dock has also been built. We didn't wait for you and created the canal on our own and disguised its formation as an earthquake. Though it created a new problem. King's Road was cut. So we built a big arched bridge. It's pretty high, your steel warship can pass easily. We also constructed a three-man obliviation team. They changed the memories of anyone who thought that the bridge was too quickly made. Some had started saying it was magic so I had to do it. In the two months of your journey, we also received 120,000 people. They have been given housing in Winter City. One of Wolf's swords has taken the position of city mayor and is currently creating a police department. Many of the people were unskilled so they were given some skill development classes. We currently have 20,000 working in agriculture and 40,000 working on the building of Norgold in Ramsgate. 20,000 were sent to receive military training in a new military academy I established in Wolf's Wood. It's run and taught by 10 Wolf's Sword. The remaining 40,000 have chosen various other professions. We lack blacksmiths for now though. The creation of your naval force has also been fluent. We have gathered 30,000 men. They are receiving training in the Naval Academy started on Sea Dragon Point. It is run by 20 Wolf's Sword. We have also received the news that nearly all Lord in the North had a huge harvest this time. They all said that they have even more than they need. They all sent thank you letters. Big orders of butterbeer and fire whiskey have become common now. Just last month, we made around 40,000 gold dragons from it. It's becoming even more popular. That's all, Dobby relaxed. All the people in the room looked at him with shocked faces. When the hell did you do all that? I saw you in front of the TV most of the time and whenever you were not there, you were playing with Rena, Benyon asked. Magic is very convenient my friend. Besides, I don't really need to sleep much. Dobby nonchalantly replied. Too efficient, Dobby. You even did the things that I was just planning on. Thanks, man, Alexander praised him. I guess, some traits of old house elves are still there he though. Alright, everything's good, I guess. Ned, in the name of all the gods, I name you Lord of Moat Kalin. 
From now on, you will be known as the Stark of Moat Kalin. I don't want you to change your name like the Karstarks, Alexander said. Ned looked surprised and asked. Bebat, what about Brandon? Shouldn't he receive it? No, he's my heir. Also, I'm giving him the Norgold. It's going to be a city even bigger than Bravu's and King's Landing. But don't take Moat Kalin as a joke, Ned. It's the first line of defense and now with the canal connecting east and west, a city as big as King's Landing would be built there. Your duty will be to collect small money from ships passing the canal for maintaining it. I'll send a wolf sword to teach you about management and creating a good police department too. Alexander explained. Ned stood up and kneeled, I will uphold the honor and justice. I will do my duty to the best of my ability, uncle. You can count on me. Haha, <laughs> good, now get up, Alexander patted him on the shoulder. Now, the next thing is, I have created many changes to the north. I don't want to do more before we properly absorb the current one. So, our job for the next five years will be to become the most powerful and richest house in the world. Make the North the most powerful kingdom. I want those 10 million gold dragons turned into 100 million. After everything becomes normal, I'll start bringing more revolutionary changes. Let's do it, guys. Meeting dismissed as he said that, they all started to walk around and get to their job. Ned went to tell his wife about his new job. If I remember correctly, the crown in the T.V show had more than 10 million debt by the end. Let's see how much I can increase it this time. Robert has married Cersei already and she was pregnant too. Now, we need to know what will happen after the honeymoon period passes. Varys has indicated that Robert is returning back to his former self slowly. Should I help him? Alexander talked to himself. Grandpa, let's go out. I want to learn how to use a Baurina came running to him. Oh, why do you want to learn it? He warmly asked. It will make me stronger. I want to beat the cat lady. She said she do not like John and never let me play with Rob. She pouted. Well, I am sure many want to put an arrow in her. She's too annoying. Okay, sweetie. But you must promise me to never use it on the cat, or any other person if he's not a very bad guy. You can use it on targets though. Let's go. Alexander took her to the courtyard and made her a soft and light bow. She looked very cute trying to hit the target. Alexander quietly clicked some pictures to show them to her when she grows up. Chapter 63, 63. One year and a fat oaf. It had been one year since Alexander's return from his short travel. Things have been smooth. 300 ships have already arrived and commissioned into Northern Naval Service. 12,500 men serve on the ships as of then. They were all contract bound. The captains were godroids for now, although they had already started to train their first officer to become a captain. As only one fleet of 250 ships was completed, he had assigned 10 godroids as Commodore, 5 as Rear Admiral, 2 as Vice Admiral, and 1 Wolf's Sword as the Admiral. The ship models he brought from Doremon Word had been made big and real with big light and upgrade light. Magic cannons and other things were installed and then commissioned into the Navy. The steel warship was currently under construction in the Navy's shipyard at the Sea Dragon Point, though it was all an illusion. He already had them fully complete. It was going to be officially introduced to the Navy later. The shipyard was also heavily guarded by constant patrol ships and magic cannons on guard towers. He gave away the remaining 50 ships of 300 to Coast Guard for securing the borders. They also had a wolf's sword as commissioner. His current fleet was already the biggest fighting fleet in West Eros and many big lords had heard the news of North's new mighty fleet. Currently, his fleet worked in some escorting work for big merchant ships of the North. He had also given Manderleys a new design for trading ships and they were too happy to make it. He was to have another delivery of 100 ships in some time, but that was for later. As for today, Alexander was going to be at another lord's meeting. How have all of you been? Alexander asked while sitting in his chair in the meeting hall. My lord, the last time we met here, you gave us the wonderful means to make food. Now, not only do we have enough to feed ourselves but we also sell to the east with Manderley's new merchant fleet. We are richer than ever, my lord Great Yon Umber respectively spoke. Manderley stood up and started speaking. That is also due to Lord Stark. He gave me the new design for the trade ships. They are faster and store more, there's also the northern fleet which provides us the safety of travel. I am afraid, so much money is coming, I'll have to create another big vault. Ha ha ha, I might have a solution for that. All of you must have seen the new great city on Ramsgate, now called Norgold. It is due to open in a week and you are all invited. It's going to be the biggest trading city in the world. I also talked to the officials from the Iron Bank. They have accepted my proposal to open their branch in Norgold. You will all be able to store your money there. The city will also be safeguarded by a huge amount of police and navy. The Northern Naval Headquarters will be there so it's going to be quite safe. All of you are also gifted a manor there to live. House Manderley's White Harbor will become a manufacturer and industrial hub from now on. So, no one will lose anything. Alexander informed. Alexander was also going to start Merchants Guild in the city. It will work under the jurisdiction of the city mayor who will work under the lord. A proper chain of command was going to be established to make sure that the city flourishes. My lord, my sale of vodka has been bringing a lot of money to my house as well, but I've recently come across a problem. I received a raven from my biggest buyer in reach that they are not allowed to buy my vodka if I do not buy their crops. Lord Dustin spoke. Yes, my lord. I received the same threat for my rice and rice wine. Howland Reed spoke. 
It was rare for him to come out of the neck. Many other lords also voiced their problems coming from the Reach. Silence. I've heard you all. I will deal with Reach. Do not stop your production. When Norgold opens, you can open your shops there and sell it from there to the rest of the world. We must have put a big dent in Reach's coffers by not buying their overpriced food. They are foolish to think that the threats will work. All of you, send ravens to every big house in West Eros. If they do any kind of business with the Reach, we will not sell them our drinks, crops, and other products. If all they want is food, they can buy it from us at a lower price than Reach. Also, if they still do business with the Reach, we will stop protecting their vassals from pirates. Alexander loudly proclaimed. Reach could have found hundreds of other ways to deal with their food. Sell them to Asai, they always need food there. But no, they wanted to pressurize the North. My lord, what if they still keep on doing business with Reach? Won't we lose money? Ruse Bolton spoke up. What do you want then? We bend ourselves to cater to Reach? Buy food from them even when we don't need it? Don't forget we are hardened, northern warriors. Those flower lovers have nothing on us. We have the mightiest navy, we have money, we have strong armies too. Why should we fear anyone? Also, have you forgotten who Robert's best friend is? Crownlands will not do business with Reach. Vale too, I have helped Lord John Arryn to get rid of some pirate problem. Stormlands might side with Reach. I have good relations with Dorne as well so they might just stay neutral. We still buy some food from Riverlands just to keep them happy, so they will not go against us. We have nothing to lose but much to gain. Alexander's words silenced any voice against his decision and the hall erupted in loud cheers. They all happily went away to prepare to go to the opening of Norgold. High Garden, Reach. Mother, did you read this? Such audacity. I say they want war with us. Mace Tyrell showed a letter to his mother Olena, sitting in the garden. Shut up, you stupid oaf. If they wanted war they would have already done so. No one in West Eros can fight their navy. Lord Stark also has a firm grip on each house in the north. Even the Boltons are afraid of doing something wrong. It was you who declared war by sending those letters. Why did you think you could force them to buy food from us when they do not need it? Sometimes I really wonder if you are my real son but then I remember giving birth to you. Sigh it seems I'll have to go and meet this Lord Stark. Let's see if he is as the legends say she went into deep thoughts. Bebot, we can raise an army of a hundred thousand. Mace refuted. And, you do know that waging war on another kingdom without the consent of the king is treason. And even if we call for all banners, what then? They have rebuilt the Moat Kaelin, even better than before. The same Moat Kaelin which protected the north from Undals for thousands of years. Now, they also have a big canal dividing the north from the south. And before you say that we block them near the Great Bridge, arched bridge over the Great Moat Canal. They also have a mighty navy. Now, go and play with some flowers, don't bother me she shoot him away. Alexander quietly sat in his office talking to his men at the new Iron Bank. They were finalizing all the plans and also the new insurance branch that Alexander was making. Traders could buy the insurance and pay a small amount monthly to secure their trade in the seas from pirates. The Northern Navy would protect all those that take the insurance. They would be given a special small flag to put on ships. Whenever they are attacked, the flag would secretly send a signal to the nearest Northern Navy vassal. He knew that people would not trust them but he had a small trick for that. He was going to remove all the murderers and wrap asterisk STS from the pirates and only let the small time thieves work. Their job would be to terrorize some traders and not harm them, then the Northern Navy would come and save them. When the words will travel, they will start taking the insurance. Then he'll hire some more small time pirates to periodically show some threats. He'll also be getting rid of most pirates except the ones working for him. Ones with low sins will be given jobs and those with high sins will be judged. He was also going to present other kinds of insurance later but for that, he'll need to have strict control over the whole West Arrows. Knock knock. Alina entered, boss, I just received word that the citadel is burning in green flames. Our men secretly helped them to escape. Marwyn and other Archmaesters have convinced everyone to come here to Winter City and establish a new citadel in the Tower of Knowledge. Another thing, the first batch of 300 doctors and 1000 nurses have graduated. 100 doctors will remain here and work in the city hospital. 150 will go to the new Norgold City and operate from three different hospitals. The rest 50 of them will go to Moat City. Good, good. When the next batch of doctors and nurses graduates, tell all the serving members of the government, police, and defense, that their health benefits service has started. Also, send a rear admiral and 50 ships under his command to Old Town to bring the Maesters here, Alexander instructed. Chapter 64, 64. Dealing with Tyrells. Oliana Tyrell took the ship to Winterfell. This would not have been possible if not for the sudden discovery of the new route on the White Knife River. While heading towards the White Harbor, she noticed a big city in the distance. It was supposed to be the biggest city of West Eros, Norgold. It wasn't open though. She had brought her eldest grandson, Willis Tyrell, with her. The boy had accidentally injured his leg in a tourney and now couldn't walk without a cane. He mostly indulged in reading and gazing at stars nowadays as he knew that he would not be the next Lord of High Garden. She wanted to bring him out for a while as he was her favorite grandson. A day later, they arrived at Winter City. It was truly beautiful. Big beautiful buildings, fountains, no smell of overflowing sewage like the King's Landing. By far the biggest attraction of the city was the big tall tower in the center of the city. It was the new citadel from what she knew. 
The wildfire accident at Citadel was truly a saddening thing, but nonetheless a blessing in disguise. The Citadel was a leech that only sucked money out of reach and gave nothing in return. Then she, with her servants, walked towards the big tower, the top floors of the tower was supposed to be a high-quality inn and also the second residence of Lord Stark. She was quickly taken to the 64th floor where her residence was booked. It was quite scary to travel in the box thing to so high in the air, but still exciting. The residence was also amazing. The rooms were even better than the highest quality inn in King's Landing. The best thing was the amazing view from there. Because the weather was clear, she could also see a small part of the wall up north. This is so amazing, grandmother. To think that it was made by men, in just a year is unbelievable. Northerners are really hard workers. Will is said, looking out of the window. Yes, they are very dangerous, Olena said. Dangerous. Didn't you see the hustle and bustle in the city? There were well-dressed guards, people happily talking about their lord, some even calling him god. Imagine the amount of money that comes into their coffers. And there are supposed to be two more cities like or even bigger than this. There's also talk that the Iron Bank is going to open their new branch in their new city, Norgold. I won't be surprised if the Starks are already the richest house in the Seven Kingdoms. Olena explained with a contemplative voice. Knock knock. Their guard opened the door, greetings, Lady Olena. I am Creed, Squire of Lord Stark. Lord Stark has invited you to lunch at the terrace. If you are free, I can take you right now, or you can come later Creed respectfully said. We will join right now, she said and followed behind. Soon, they reached the magnificent terrace restaurant. There was no roof, many artificial trees were placed to provide some shade. There was also a sliding retractable roof for rainy and snowy days. They were taken to a spot reserved for House Stark. Olena saw Alexander for the first time, talking to what seemed like a servant and laughing with them. Just that, spoke leaps and bounds about that man and why everyone respects him. He still looked quite handsome even after being so old. She imagined what he would have looked like in younger days. No one in Westeros knew much about the new Lord Stark. They only know that he's strong and smart. As she moved forward, Alexander stood up. She was again surprised to see a man so old and yet look so fit. Welcome to the north, Lady Olena. I hope you like the view and will also like the food, Alexander spoke. The view is certainly marvelous, and the food is yet to be tasted, she replied. Haha. Then let's get to it. Alexander sat down on the table by the railing. When they sat down, they were given menus. She was baffled by the number of dishes available. They ordered their food and waited. My lord, forgive me for asking but what is that red cross sign? Will is asked, pointing to the hospital, down in the distance. Oh, that is a hospital. Any man and woman can go there to get treated for a very cheap price. All kinds of diseases and damages are healed there. The Red Cross sign has been adopted by the Healers Guild. You will find them all across the north in certain buildings. It shows that there's a healer. Alexander explained. Why spend so much money on small folks? He inquired. I won't say too much but happy small folks means happy kingdom that's what I believe in. If you want to know more, you can go to our schools. All kinds of subjects are taught there. The Maesters also teach there. Alexander replied. I will surely pay a visit. Oh, the food has arrived, Willis exclaimed. After eating, it came to serious business talks. I am sure you didn't just come here to sightsee, Lady Oliena. I won't drag this but I was very upset when my vassal lords told me that they received threats from Lord Tyrell, he straight up said. Oh, that stupid oaf. He doesn't even know the bee of business. All he has is handed to him in inheritance, she replied. Then why isn't Willis the lord? He certainly is smart and honest, Alexander asked. Because of my leg. Just like what people named my uncle Garth the Gross, they would name me Will as the Crippled Flower or something like that. My father doesn't want that, Will is sadly replied. Well, what if I can get your leg healed? Alexander asked. Even if I believe that you can do it. Why would you? Oliana questioned. Because I will not take back my blockade from trading with you unless Mace gives his lordship to someone more intelligent. I don't believe that Mace won't do something stupid like this again. I know it, you know it, Will is knows it and probably the whole West Eros knows it. Your son probably has an IQ of 70 or below. Alexander said, IQ, Will is asked, it's a test I've made which lets us assess people's intelligence, a score of 70 to 79 means cognitively impaired, a score of above 130 means very gifted, Alexander briefly explained, I would like to take that test, he said excitedly, sure, but the point stands, do you want to let your house go to ruins because of one bad fish or will you work to change it, Alexander asked, what's in it for you, she asked, peace, I hate it when small folks die because some foolish lord got too ambitious, Peace also means flourishing population and trade. But there's one condition, Willis will stay here in the north. He will get healed and also study in the new school in the Tower of Knowledge. He will learn how to govern and do business, Alexander clearly said. He will also be taught the benefits of a democracy he added under his breath. So you want him as hostage Oliana replied with a slightly angry tone. Why would I do that? If I wanted to harm the Reach or the House Tyrell, I just send my navy and army. I want the Reach and the North to have good relations in the future. Doing this can help us a lot, Willis will also befriend many heirs of northern lords here. They all study at school. Not just northern lords, many heirs from Vale and Riverlands study there. You have a lot to gain and I have nothing to lose. 
What about this blockade and how do you expect to get Mace to give up his lordship? She asked. Well, you should come to the opening of the Iron Bank of West Eros in Norgold in a few days. They have a new plan that can help your ships to easily trade as far as Asai in the Jade Sea. If it's about Lord Mace, I think you can deal with him. He said, looking straight into her eyes. He knows about my late husband she thought for a split second. Okay, I will visit Norgold next time. Willis will live here from now on. Please tell someone to sell him a house here. Sure, it will be done. Now, please excuse me, I have to go back to Winterfell Alexander said and left. Alexander returned to his office in the Winterfell castle, he had just sat down and received a call from Jake and H. Gar. What happened? He asked. All father, we just received a contract for you, he informed. Oh, this seems interesting. Who was it? He asked. We tracked down the man who brought the request. Someone by the name of Petir Baelish was the one behind it, Jaqen answered. Okay, thanks for telling me. I'll deal with him, Alexander said. It is my honor to be useful, the faceless man replied and hung up. Alexander then called Varys how are you, my boy? I am fine, but I can't say the same about King's Landing. The streets are ramping with dirt and rats. People are dying of hunger and disease. The king has gone back to his old ways, for some reason he thinks that his kids are bastards. I can't really complain though, if you saw the kids even you would doubt it. The baldy blabbered. Haha, <laughs> I know they are most probably Cersei and some other Lannister mans. Anyway, I didn't call you for this. Is there a man named Petir Baelish working in Red Keep? He asked. Petir Baelish. Hmm. Yes, there seems to be a man named that. He works for Lord John. He also owns some brothels in the city. Why suddenly so interested in him? He hired faceless men to assassinate me. Don't worry, they serve me and told me about this. I want you to keep an eye on him. Also, I am sending you a potion. It increases the chances of siring a child. Give it to both Lord John and his wife and then lock them in a room. That Petir Baelish has some fishy relationship with the Tully daughters. Alexander instructed. Are you suggesting? Hauserin is in danger. Yes. John is foolish but still a good man at heart. He cares about small folks, I'll help him this time. I also want you to send me a full list of all the problems faced by small folks in King's Landing. I might visit soon, Alexander seriously said. Yes, I'll personally do it. I also have a request if it's not too much. Can you give me something that can protect me in case someone attacks? This place is becoming too dangerous day by day. No one can be trusted. Everyone is playing their own game and I would like to have some insurance, Varys said. Alexander nodded, I'll send it with the potion. Then he laid back on his chair and thought about how to improve the lives of people all around. Chapter 65, 65. Attacked. Word of North's new might had been circulating around West Eros for a while now, and all the major lords were invited for the opening of the Iron Bank of West Eros. The city of Norgold had been opened with full grandeur. People had been moving into the big city for a while already, so the opening was just for the show. The business had already been going on there. The naval headquarters were there, so many northern navy warships also patrolled the waters near the city. The population of the city was already 200,000 and they were all working people. The northern lords were told to buy a shop in the shopping district and a big warehouse as a large amount of trade would happen from here. The fact that the Bravus was also not very far away from Norgold also made sure that more people visited the new city. He had been staying in the city for the past week and helping organize things. He was just waiting for other lords to arrive and open the bank tomorrow. For the ease of travel, Alexander had given the method of making concrete and asphalt. All the northern roads above the neck were newly built with it. The best and widest of them was King's Road. However, he expected many lords to come from ships, only those who want to assess the north would come by road. Boss, I received word from Hormon. He said that many tribes have agreed and are headed to Hardhome. Dobby informed. Good, redirect the new 100 ships coming here to Hardhome. Their first task is to take them to Skagos. I will join them the day after tomorrow, he replied. One by one, people started to arrive in the city. Robert was still a bit scared of Alexander so he didn't come. Instead, he sent his lord hand, John Arryn. Tywin Lannister arrived with his brother Kevin Lannister. He didn't bring Tyrion, as he saw him as his family's disgrace. Oliana was already there. Hoster Tully came with his younger brother Brendan Blackfish Tully. No one came from the Stormlands as its lord was more interested in tourneys than business. Surprisingly, Doran Martell came with his brother Oberyn Martell. It was the Iron Bank's opening so it wasn't Alexander's show to run. He was there as a guest. He had already fully taken over the Iron Bank. The new five elders were Alexander's disguised wolf's sword and the older ones were dead. They did a good job of managing everything. The Iron Bank was a feared organization. Nobody wanted to fall to its bad side. It was even more feared now that they had taken over the Golden Company. The Golden Company had now sworn forever fealty to the Iron Bank. They would fight if someone denied paying back the loans. The bank was opened with some fireworks and then everyone was given small booklets to see the services offered by the bank. Its latest addition, the Iron Savior, an insurance company, gave trade vassals security in the seas. It said that all the ships registered with the insurance will be insured from any pirate attacks. If they are still attacked then the bank will give its materials worth to the owner party. The whole thing was a tie-up with the Northern Navy. 
This also meant that from now on, the Iron Bank and the North would be in a strong partnership, and attacking the North would mean partially attacking the Iron Bank. After the opening was done, it was time for a garden party and mingling with each other. Alexander was talking to Oliana with a butterbeer bottle in his hand. So, this is what you meant by another way. If what the pamphlet said is true then it would surely help us sell our food in the Far East, she said. And I advise you to move fast. What if someone else makes a deal with buyers there before you, Alexander warned. I certainly will, but for now, let's enjoy this tasty food, she said and took a bite from a lemon-flavored pastry. Then she went to get some more. Lord Stark, what a magnificent city you've built. Not just that, but you've also attracted the Iron Bank. This will surely help many houses in West Eros. John Arryn came up to him. Haha, just call Alexander, John. We're both old boys here, Alexander jokingly replied. Haha, yes yes. So, how's King's Landing doing? He asked. Fine, I'd say, but I can't say for how long. The warning you gave Robert that day worked wonders for a while but since he married, he's been getting worse. He returning back to being his old self. Whoring and organizing tourneys. All the hard work we did all these years went to waste. The crown has started to lose money and unemployment is rampant. John sadly replied. Hmm, I can't do much for Robert but I can do a lot for the people of King's Landing. I'll come to King's Landing sometime in the future and talk with you there. How about that? I'll be eagerly waiting, Alexander, John nodded. Now, to the happy news. I heard that your wife is pregnant. Alexander changed the topic. John happily smiled hearing that, yes, let's just hope that it's a healthy child. Oh, surely will. When the child gets old enough you can even send him or her to be fostered here. There's no better place to learn how to be a good lord than the Tower of Knowledge. He bragged. I might just do that. He said. Then Oberyn and Doran Martell also joined them. Doran didn't have gout yet, so he could walk just fine. Lord Stark, thank you for inviting us here, Doran spoke. Yes, so many of us, Oberyn said looking at Tywin. Alexander was about to reply but something bumped into his leg. He looked down and saw little Rena. She was so engrossed in eating her ice cream that she didn't see where she was going. Her ice cream cup was about to fall but Alexander caught it quickly. Hey, sweetie, don't walk while eating or it will fall. I made a lot of ice cream for you so there's no hurry. Alexander said and picked her up while she continued eating. Sorry, Grandpa. I'll be careful. She replied and ate another spoonful of cold dessert. Ah, this must be the cute Rena. The great Lord Stark and his beloved granddaughter have been the talk of many ladies in King's Landing. There are even some paintings of you and Rena sitting on your shoulder, John exclaimed. Haha, many people usually see me playing with her so they must have started talking. Still, no harm done, Alexander laughed it off. Oberyn continuously looked at Rena. Alexander also noticed Alina in the background looking at him nervously, worried that Oberyn and Doran might recognize Rena as Renis. What is ice cream? Oberyn asked. Oh, it's cold and tasty, Rena cutely replied. Haha. Then I must try it. Will you show me where this ice cream is Rena? He asked. Sure, just follow me. Rena got down from Alexander's arms and ran towards a table with her empty cup. She probably just wanted to get more for herself. No need to worry, child. No one can recognize you. He sent a mental message to Alina. She nodded her head and walked off to talk with someone. After that, Alexander returned to his office. There were enough people there to help any lord in setting up whatever business or deal they wanted. He wasn't needed there. His main focus for now was the free folks. He needed to go to Skagos first and change its topography. Leaving Norgold, he alone flew to Skagos. It was really a barren land. Not many people lived there either and most of them were cannibals. The talk about unicorns was fake too. There were some weird species of horses that the people of the island used. The horses had two sharp straight horns on their heads. The horses were also trained to use them in fights. He purified all those that deserved death and corrected others with time torture. He couldn't really kill everyone. If he started doing that then most of the world's population would be gone. After dealing with the local people he started changing the island's topography. He flattened the barren mountains and in their place created grasslands, forests, small hills with mines. Rivers were already present. Now, all that remains is bringing the free folks here he said to himself and again flew up to catch up with his fleet of 100 ships. The ships took three days to reach Hart Home. By then, all the tribes had gathered there. They were reluctant to come to Hart Home as they considered it a haunted place but still came as it was the best place to board the ships. Haha. <laughs> How are you Hormon? It seems you've become a big leader here, Alexander greeted. They unanimously agreed to let me lead this time. This also makes me their target if things don't go as promised, Hormon replied. Then you should be happy as the island is better than one can even expect Alexander patted his shoulder. Then they started to walk off to the tent where other leaders were present. But suddenly, out of nowhere an arrow came, targeting Alexander. He quickly caught it with bare hands before it even touched him. This craftsmanship is from Vale. Bring that guy to me, Alexander said and pointed to a man in the crowd. Chapter 66, 66. Braun. Soon, the attacker was brought into a small room and was tied to a wooden pillar. Name. Alexander questioned. Braun, the man said. I didn't think I'd see him here. He quickly looked into his memories. Braun had been bullied since he was small. His own parents used to beat him. First killed a person at the age of 12 in order to protect himself. 
since then, has done various deeds to make money. He was probably slightly better than many people in West Eros. So, Bron, who sent you to kill me? Alexander asked. Ruse Bolton, he gave me 50 dragons to kill you. 25, advance and rest the after killing, Bron quickly replied. You are being very easy to talk to. Why? Well, I'm a sellsword. I work for money, but you know what sounds better than money? My head over the shoulder he replied. Wise words coming out of a sellsword. So, what do you think I should do with you? I don't know, set me free. He said in his sarcastic voice. Sure, go, Alexander untied the rope. Bron just looked at that all surprised, but before he could say anything, Alexander picked Bron's sword and tore it from the middle like it was a piece of paper. Good luck reaching the wall without any weapons. Though do tell me, haven't you heard that I and my first sword fought hundreds of men in King's Landing before I killed the Mad King? Why did you still take up the request? He was seriously amused by Bron. the whole already West Eros knew not to mess with him, but here he was. Yeah, I had heard them. Like most legends and rumors, I thought it was also exaggerated. I also didn't have much money to buy food so I took it. There aren't really that many sellswords who would agree to this job, so Lord Bolton gave it to me. Bron truthfully replied. Hmm, in the end, it really comes down to money. Good, how would you like to work for me? Alexander asked. Depends on what you want, Bron haggled. Even in this situation, you want to bargain. Well, I'll give you 100 golds a month. If you do a good job, I might as well give you a castle. So, what's it gonna be? Alexander offered. Where do I sign? Brun happily asked. Alexander quickly gave him a page and a quill. He signed quickly. Then for a split second, his body shone in white light. What did I just sign on? His face looked pale. You, my friend, just sold yourself to me. From now on, you cannot betray me. If you try to tell anyone about me or my people or my magic, you'll feel a lot of pain and will be forced to come to me and confess. Though, I am also duty-bound to pay you and if you do good then promote you. Alexander briefly explained. That's not possible, Bron scoffed and quickly got out of the tent and started shouting. Lord Stark is a and can asterisk. The most important words just didn't come out of his mouth and he also felt pain in his body. Then his body automatically went back to Alexander. I tried to tell everyone that you're a sorcerer and can tear a sword like a piece of paper. Fuck, you weren't lying, what sorcery is this? Bron cursed. Welcome to the club, don't ask about my magic though, Alexander shrugged. What's my job? He asked. Entertain me and teach young lords and air swordsmanship, Alexander answered. He knew that Bron's fighting style was less knightly and more street style, which in Alexander's view was better. Beating pompous young lords and heirs? That sounds like a dream job, Bron grinned and then asked. Can I get out of this contract someday? Yeah, sure. Earn my trust and I'll give you a contract with no such harsh punishment. Now, let's go, I have work to do. Alexander stood up and left the tent. Outside, all the free folks had nearly fully boarded the ship. Hey, Tormund. How long till everyone's on board? Alexander asked the tall boy. Almost everyone's done. It's just the giants. Their mammoths are showing tantrums. All right, I'll go and help them. You go join the rest. Alexander and Bronn went to Mag the Mighty. He was trying to calm down the ten mammoths with his tribesmen. Alexander let his aura disperse around so that the mammoths could feel it. Then he sent a gentle message. Easy, your riders are taking you to a better place. There are many trees and grass here. Better than here. Behave or else they might leave you. The mammoths suddenly calmed down and started to board ships on their own. It was you wasn't it? Bronn asked. What do you think? Alexander left him scratching his head. Settling them in Skagos was easy. They were very happy when they saw the island and its surroundings. Alexander gave them a map and an owl to contact him if needed. The natives had already built small port towns so it would help them a lot. He also warned them not to kill the natives and just treat them like other free folks. He then lent them 10 trading ships from his inventory and returned to Norgold. The moment he popped out into his office, he was greeted with children's giggles. Someone probably brought the kids there. Alexander's office, no matter where, was probably the safest place on earth. Anna kept an eye on them. The kids, Alexandra, Eric, John, and Rena were playing with toys and Rena was acting like their mother. Hey, wolf girl. What happened? Why are you all in here? He asked Anna. Oh, some guy with a sword attacked the kids while they were playing together. The wolf's sword caught him even before he could come near them, but they were all spooked and started crying. They wanted to be with you so I brought them here. Anna explained. Alexander knew that someone would attack them but not this soon. Everyone knew that Alexander loved the kids as if his own children. The attacker must have thought that hurting them would make the old man like him go crazy. He warmly looked at the children. All the small ones had turned one or slightly more. They all could walk. He sat down on the big couch and flew them all into his arms. Then he entertained them for a while. Grandpa, why did the bad man try to hurt us? Rena asked, looking at his face with big eyes. Oh, my dear sweetling. He's a bad man and wanted to make me angry by hurting you. I am sorry you had to see that. Alexander sadly apologized. No, Grandpa, it's not your mistake. I'll train more with the bow and beat all the bad guys, Rena said with her fist clenched tight and face fully serious. Alexander's heart melted away at that moment and squeezed her and the kids in his arms. And Grandpa will hunt all the bad guys down before they even think about harming you all, not just you but all the kids in the world. 
Time for kisses he suddenly roared and started kissing them. They all giggled and fought him. Realizing that doing things slowly was making matters worse, he sent the order to bring the rest of the remaining 600 common ships to the north. He was going to station two fleets of 250 ships in the north. One on the east coast, at Norgold, and one on the west coast, at the northern naval shipyard and production hub, Wolf City at Sea Dragon Point. One of the remaining fleet would be stationed near Bravus with permission from the Sea Lord to help Iron Bank in its insurance business. The last fleet would be used for his first attack on foreign soil and then stationed there. He was going to take over Karth, in the east. It was a very big and rich city due to its location. It controlled the Jade Gates, which was the passage towards further east and from further east to west. They also have a very big fleet of merchant ships, probably about 2,000 ships combined. The trade there was monopolized by three guilds of competing merchant princes, the Thirteen, the Tourmalin Brotherhood, and the ancient guild of Spicers. There was also the warlocks of the House of Undying. They dabble in black magic and dark rituals to do magic and to extend their lives. They all had their lives forfeited the moment he came to the world. If he takes that city, he'll have the power to promote trade around the world and bring development faster. There was also the problem of slavery which he would have to solve soon. So much to do. Sigh at least the north is on track. Once everything settles, I'll start the phase two. He went to the dungeons of Norgold. The attacker was held there. Brandon was beating the guy himself. Who sent you? Tell me, he yelled. He he the prisoner laughed with his bloody mouth. I'll do it, Brandon. No need to get physical. Alexander stopped him. Then he entered the guy's brain and started to mumble loudly. So, a sellsword from Essos. Oh, this is a surprise. The Ironborn. They aren't happy with my navy keeping peace in the seas. They wanted to warn me. Oh, and what's this? They are planning a rebellion. Well, let's see how that'll go Alexander mumbled. H how do you know that? The shocked man asked. I have my ways. Now, forget everything he said and put the man to eternal death. Even I wouldn't fall so low to attack children, Bronn interjected. Well, Bronn, what would you do in this situation? If I had the world's strongest fleet, I'd go straight up there and teach the fuckers, they reap what they sow, he nonchalantly said. Haha, I see what you did there. Their motto is we do not sow. Still, if I attack them then it'd be seen as a rebellion. Then I'll also have to fight all the other houses for no reason as they would fight me to take away my wealth. Which I don't want to do yet Alexander replied. Yet? You mean you will in the future? Braun asked, he wasn't really serious when he had said that. I will neither confirm nor deny that. Let's go on now. We have to prepare for the siege of Karth Alexander said and walked away with Brandon. What the f asterisk ck, when did that happen? Braun cursed loudly. Chapter 67, 67. Flea bottom. It took some time to place his fleets in the right place. Thankfully, his chosen admirals from Wolf's Sword were very trained in commanding. The Eastern and Western fleet had taken their position. The Sentinel fleet was also positioned near Bravus. Alexander's attack fleet which he was going to use was waiting for him near the Summer Isles. His fleet of 250 warships, 15 man of war, 2 ship of the line, and Yamato warship were quite intimidating. He was also bringing 4 more Yamato steel warships. But before that, he was going to King's Landing. Alexander's printing press was running at full speed. Various books about laws and stuff were being spread around the world. Many posters of Alexander were also being spread in all poor parts of West Eros. He was being hailed as the king of small folks. To strengthen his image he was going to help the poor of King's Landing. So, Dobby, you'll join me when I start the siege of Karth. When you're not here, Alina, Benyon, and Anna will watch over the administration of the North. I'll be taking Braun and Creed with me, Alexander told his people and left. Never really thought I'd see a day when we'd siege a city in the East, Anna exclaimed. Well, he's a god. He can do whatever he wants, Benyon replied and everyone nodded their heads. Brandon had been made the Lord of Norgold, so he and his small family were living there. Though they had a port Kea and came to Winterfell every day, Brandon was taught how to be a good lord for the past whole year so he was doing good now. Ashura and Alexandra mostly spent their time in Winterfell. Ned was not so lucky, he couldn't tell his wife about Alexander and he didn't want to either. He also comes to Winterfell once in a while to see John. His wife was also pregnant again. Small Council, King's Landing. All the members sat silently waiting for the king. The small council had seven members in it. One hand of the king, Lord John Arryn. Two Grand Maester, Pisel. Three Master of Coins, currently vacant. Four Master of Laws, Lord Renly Baratheon. Five Master of Ships, Lord Stannis Baratheon. Six Master of Whisperers, Varys. Seven Lord Commander of the King's Guard, Ser Beristan Selmy. It was a rare meeting as today the king was going to come to. Normally, the king was required to come to all meetings but the current king was too incompetent and would rather spend that time with pleasure women. The gate suddenly opened and the slightly fat king entered. Robert had started gaining weight since last year, behind him was his king's guard, Ser Beristan Selmy. Surprisingly the queen was also behind them. Normally the queen wasn't supposed to be there, but Robert had allowed it to happen. After all, it was Lannister's paying for his pleasures. Sit down, all of you. You all know, Lord Stark is going to visit us. I don't want any of you to mess up. I will not face his anger because of your incompetence Robert roared. He was still a bit scared of Alexander. 
The word incompetence doesn't feel good from your mouth John thought. Come on my dear, he's just a small lord. You are a king. What's there to fear? Cersei I spoke in her arrogant voice. That small lord single-handedly took down the king's landing and beheaded the mad king. His first sword, Ser Dobby, single-handedly killed 300 of your Lannister soldiers. Robert angrily spoke. He also has the mightiest navy in the world. More than 1,000 warships. Even if all the southern lords combined our might, we wouldn't be able to fight them Lord Stannis said with a bit of worship in his voice. He has also rebuilt the Moat Kaelin, so no one can attack them from the land. He also has new flourishing cities bigger than King's Landing. Not to mention the recent news about their collaboration with the Iron Bank. They are the strongest house in West Eros, your grace, Pycelle added. Cersei's face looked horror-filled, when did the world change so much? She asked herself. Yes, I think their armies are as strong too. When I went there for the opening of the Iron Bank, someone attacked the little children that Lord Stark had taken as his grandkids. The man was neutralized even before he reached the kids by those masked wolf's sword. Jonarin told them. Now you understand why I don't want to anger him, woman. Robert asked. Be but, you are the king she mumbled. Shut up. Not one more word from your mouth. Renly, increase the city's security. I don't want any new crime to happen. Also, get someone to clean the streets, he ordered. Now, I need to go back. I am busy, he left. What's the point of this, we can't hide the whole city John thought. Alexander stepped down from the ship on harbor. The city was stinking, the sewers must have either collapsed or jammed. You can see the King's Landing on illustration channel of my Discord, https colon slash slash discord dot gg slash dghcron. Or see them on Instagram https colon slash slash www dot instagram dot com slash mr underscore immortal underscore novel. Oof, the King of Seven Kingdoms live in this shit-filled city. Braun interjected. Sadly, yes, Alexander replied and walked. He cast a bubblehead charm on himself and his men. I don't know what you did, but thank you, Bronn took a long breath. Creed, you take our men to my mansion. I'll go and have a talk with John, Alexander instructed. His mansion was situated slightly west of the Red Keep. Bronn, I want you to go to Flea Bottom and assess the situation there. The standards of living, crime, and helpfulness of the city watch. Things like these? Why do I get to go to the shittiest part of the city? He complained and walked off. Alexander then headed to the Red Keep with two wolves sword behind him. It was all the same as he saw the last time. Surprisingly, an old man with a balding head and long white beard was waiting for him. Lord Stark, welcome to King's Landing, Pycel greeted. Thank you, Grand Maester, though I must say, the smell isn't really welcoming here. Ah, uh, yes, the sewers haven't been cleaned in a long time. Lord Stark, I must thank you for giving the Order of Maesters a place in Winter City. Yes, I need to meet with John. I'll talk to you later, Grand Maester. Alexander ignored him and went away. He's too unfit for the job of Grand Maester. He's practically under T-Win's hands. His time has come now he thought and placed a curse on him. Pycelle would slip from the stairs in a few days and break his neck. John, my friend. How are you? He asked as he entered Han's chamber. Ah, Alexander. Nice to meet you again. I've cleared my schedule to help you with whatever you need, John replied. Haha. I don't need much John. All I ask is to allow my men to buy some buildings in Flea Bottom. They will build some food storage and work distribution centers. All homeless women and children will be sent to Norgold. Women will get jobs there and children will live and learn in orphanages. Doing this will decrease some load from King's Landing. I also want to upgrade the sewage and the buildings. Alexander informed. T this will cost a fortune. I can give you permission to buy but the money, John contemplated. I'm not asking for money, John. I am sponsoring all the work. To recover the costs, allow me to open some shops in the upgraded flea bottom in the future. I'll recover the cost myself, he proposed. This. It is a good plan. I will write the papers. How long will it take to bring your men? John asked. They are already here and have started to draw plans. Just make sure that City Watch doesn't create problems. My men will stay in my mansion so you don't have to worry about their lodging. They will also hire men from Flea Bottom so there's no problem too. I'll leave one wolf sword to protect them he answered. How strong are his wolf swords that he's just leaving one John thought. You aren't going to meet Robert. John asked. Alexander shook his head, no, I'll probably get angry. Robert has disappointed me. Let's hope his children are good. That is if they are his children. Should I tell Alexander about my doubts? No. He'll probably get too angry and kill Robert John thought. All right, John. I'll be leaving for Flea Bottom now. You should start writing things, he said and left. He walked the streets of Flea Bottom. Calling the conditions there bad would be an understatement. Due to overflowing sewers, the streets looked more like water passages. Children sat near each building asking for money or food. Their eyes were filled with hopelessness and misery. Naked women walked around, offering themselves for a coin or a loaf of bread. It really hurt him seeing all that. Then he tried to imagine what the conditions would be in cities like slave cities of Astapur, Mirian, and Yunkai, where slavery was the main trade. Pop. Suddenly a bluebird popped on his shoulder. Chirp. Haha. <laughs> my dear Barry, thank you. I was a little upset but thank you for uplifting my mood. Alexander said, scratching the phoenix's neck. Barry also rubbed his fluffy head on Alexander's cheeks. 
Then he flew into the air and started singing, uplifting the mood of everyone in Flea Bottom. I'll just take over the whole world and banish slavery. I wonder why I didn't do it already if I am 15,000 years old in this world. Something must have happened he asked himself. Chapter 68, 68. Problem in Flea Bottom. So, what did you find, Braun? Ah, the whole place is messed up, but the city guards are the most messed up. The guards ask for money to protect them or else they beat them or spoil their little shops. The commander of the city watch, Janos Slynt knows about it but doesn't do anything. He probably has a cut in the money, he reported. Well, let's see what that guy does when we start giving food and work to people, Alexander said and told his men to start the work. For now, he was offering food and work to people. Single women and single mothers were told that they'd be taken to Norgold and given jobs there. If they don't know any skill then they'll be taught. Alexander's reputation was quite good among small folks so people believed him. The two big buildings bought in the flea bottom opened their doors. The kitchen was free for children and disabled but the adults had to earn their living. They'll be given a token from the work distribution centers with their work and identity written on it. As long as they had that token, they'd receive the food every day. Ah, this world really needs something to entertain and uplift the mood. Music is the best option but it'll need electricity. Gramophone will do for now. I'll make phonograph records for various hit songs from my world. But it'll not be that amazing without all the bass and stuff. Winter City, Norgold, and Moat City can use electrical speakers though he thought. Things ran smoothly for the next four days. People loved Alexander. He talked to them, laughed with them, and played with their children. He treated them not like some peasants but equal humans. It only took four days for them to start calling him Grandpa. Alexander had pushed his full name to people. A name which people rarely knew, Alexander Maxim Universe Stark. He also made people call him Grandpa Universe. Grandpa Stark sounded too weird to him, but he had started to hear news about some gold cloaks. They recently destroyed some small in which Alexander had helped repair. He sent his wolf's swords after them. The four men were arrested and locked down in their cells after breaking their arms and legs. Those who took pleasure in others' misery were not humans. He told other gold cloaks that if they wanted the men free then their commander would have to come himself. After some hours, his wolf's sword told him that the commander was coming to him. Alexander donned his armor to look as intimidating as possible. Who dares to harm the city watch? Janos Slynt shouted. I do, Alexander walked out in full armor. Many people had seen Alexander's armor in the last rebellion so they recognized him and cheered. Who are you? Release my men, he demanded. I am Alexander Stark. Your men destroyed an inn that I just renovated. They asked for protection money. Tell me, who do you pay when you need protection, and do you also take money from small folks? Alexander asked. Janos Slynt, Category 3. Murder, 30, 5 children. R asterisk P, 87. Torture, 289. Extortion, 689. Blackmail, 854. Sin percentage, 58%. So, I am talking to a dead man. Alexander sent a probe into his mind and saw all his secrets. He had a small chest filled with money under the floor in a secret compartment in his house. He then made the guy confess. So what if I do? Who gives you the right to judge the men of City Watch? We only serve the king, Janos screeched. Bam. And I serve the common people. Even the king serves the common people and that makes the common people your superior, Alexander said. People, will you allow me to judge this man? He loudly asked. I, yes, yay many shouts came. He tied a rope to Janos's legs and started to drag him. Janos tried to stand up but couldn't. He first took the guy to his house and retrieved the money chest. Then he started dragging him towards the red keep. The crowd followed behind him. You don't know anything, the king isn't the most powerful man here. It's Lord Tywin. Most of the gold cloaks are Lannisters. If you hurt me, he'll not let it slide, Janos started mumbling, making people became even angrier. He dragged him straight into the great hall of the red keep. The court was currently in session and Robert was on his rare visit to the throne. Some poor peasant was crying in front of the king with his little daughter, nearly seven year old in his arms. His daughter was all beat up. Your grace, the gold cloaks beat my daughter because she bumped into them in the tavern. Look at her, she hasn't woken since then. You must give justice. I demand justice, he nearly shouted. Know your place, you are talking to the king. Pisel shouted in his grumpy voice. Bam. Out of nowhere, a wild, flying helmet appeared and smashed right into Pisel's head. And you should know you place old fool. Go back to your corner and right Ravens Alexander came in, fully donned into his armor. Janos Slynt being dragged behind. He really hated it when people used their position to torment common people. Varys gave an unnoticed light bow to him from the side. What the f asterisk ck did that fool do Robert thought in his head. Feeling a little scared now, Alexander looked at the poor common man. He threw Janos to the king's feet and walked to the father and daughter. The man felt scared of the tall armored man, but when he saw his face, he relaxed. Alexander removed his helmet and kneeled down beside the little girl. Such monsters, to do this to a little kid. She has internal bleeding. Thankfully, no bone is broken. But if she's left untreated, it could be life-threatening. He calmly said while checking her. My lord, see can you heal her? The man asked. Absolutely, but I'll need something. He said and then looked at Pisel. 
Old fool, bring me all these things in 10 minutes. He took out a small notepad and wrote something on it with a ball pen. Pisel had subconsciously traded T. Win's place to Alexander's in his mind. He quickly brought those things. Alexander quickly made a fake harmless potion and then added another potion which was the main magical stuff. He made the girl drink it. Then he quickly discharged the clogging blood from internal bleeding with the help of a syringe. He also used his magic to heal her 99.9%. .9%. She would still feel very light pain here and there for the next two days though. Everyone in the court silently watched everything. No one had the guts to either say something or leave. Even Robert looked at it with interest. When the girl woke up, she scaredly looked at her father and started crying. Papa. Th. They hurt me. She wailed loudly. Everything's fine, dear. I will punish the bad people. Here, take this. He gave her a sweet and sour lollipop. Can you tell me what they looked like? Alexander asked the man. Tell their faces to my men and they'll find them, he said. The man told his wolf sword the face of the four attackers. His warrior elves just used legilimency and saw the faces of them. They quickly went away to bring them. Then he suddenly remembered why he was there. Ah, I'm getting old. How are you, your grace, he said to Robert. Robert suddenly stood up and came down from his throne. Please, uncle, it's Robert for you, he said. Well, Robert, I have no problem with your bad habits, but you should at least hire competent people who can run the city. Your gold cloaks had been extorting money from small folks in the name of protection money. You either pay or get beaten. Even your city watch commander is involved. I found a chest full of money in his house. Seriously, Robert. It's just one city, I can't even imagine how you're running the Seven Kingdoms. Alexander disdainfully said. What? Janos, is that true? Robert roared. Why yes Janos meekly replied. Then death is what you'll get. What you did is treason and. Robert was interrupted by screams of four newcomers. Who are you, let us go. If Lord T. Wynne finds out about this he'll never let you go the two wolves sword and brawn brought four men tied in iron shackles. Huh. Four men to beat a small girl. I see you Lannisters have kept up the tradition since the rebellion, Alexander snorted. How dare you say that, and let them go. The girl is okay and there's no need for punishment now Cersei I entered to save the Lannister pride. Jamie quickly walked up to his sister lover. What are you doing, don't mess with him, he whispered. Jamie still remembers how easily he was defeated the last time he met Alexander. What do we have here? Robert, the last time I remembered, you were the king, and only you had the power to judge. Since when did the queen start to hold such power? He mockingly asked. Shut up, woman. That girl would have been dead if not for uncle. He saved her and the four men and Janos will be publicly executed tomorrow, he shouted, further angering the arrogant queen. Chapter 69, 69, reconciled. My father will hear about this, Circe I shouted. Then she tried to go back, but then suddenly found a sword flying just a few centimeters away from her and plunging into a pillar. How dare you talk to Robert like that? He calls me uncle and I very much desire to act the part. You are just a queen. Queen is nothing but a word and holds no power. I would not have gotten so angry at you if you had shown even a bit of sympathy for the little girl. Small folks are nothing in your eyes, right? He angrily said, he was just trying to bring Robert on the right path by showing that he had someone who had his back. Good thing he knew some acting. He had looked into the mind of Robert Baratheon. The guy had been under immense pressure since the day he became the king. Trying to keep each house happy. Needing money and for that marrying Cersei, only to find what kind of hateful woman she was later. Then there were also the kids. They had no Baratheon features and he had doubts that they were bastards. But he couldn't say anything. If he did, he'd lose the backing of Tywin, or worse, another war and he knew that no one would come to support him this time. He missed his old days when he could just relax and do whatever he wanted. When he heard Alexander's words, he once again felt like he had a family. His parents were dead. Stannis was more of an emotionless plank than a man. Renly was too girly. There was no elder to whom he could turn to in the time of need. John was like a father but he was too honorable. On the other hand, Alexander was old, Robert knew him since he was small and considered him his role model since he found out how strong Alexander was. In Robert's eyes, Alexander was the perfect man. Probably the strongest person in West Eros and also the smartest. Turning your kingdom from poor to the richest in such a small time either required the blessing of a god or extreme intelligence. Do you know what you are saying? Do you want to start a war? I can assure you that my father will destroy the north. Did you forget the reigns of Castamir? Cersei proudly stated. Haha. Have you ever been in a war? One hour. It will only take me one hour to take over Casterly Rock. And you talk about reigns of Castamir like it's a trophy. I don't call overwhelming hundreds of men, with thousands of soldiers, bravery. Your father killed women and children that day. That was not bravery, that was murder. Now, if you really feel like your father will wage war with me for this, then go on and write a raven. I'll be waiting for the reply he smirked at his last words. Jamie had to drag his angry sister away. Then Alexander looked at Robert. My boy, now I know why you took back to your past bad habits. Living with someone this insane can't be easy. You called me uncle and never asked me for help. You seriously went to t Win. He calmly said. The great hall had been emptied by then. After Robert had announced his verdict, all of the people had been sent away, except the council members. John also joined in, I told him to ask you, a lot. 
But I guess he was too scared of you after that lesson you gave him in the throne room. You can't blame me, if it was someone else, they would have already shat their pants. I remember T Win's scared face back then. Haha, <laughs> Robert embarrassingly replied. Son, if you promise to better yourself, I'll help you. You won't need to depend on Lannister's money. I'll help you organize the city trade in such a way that you'll automatically start making profits. Don't ever forget my words, Robert. Happy small folks means happy kingdom. Alexander gave him some wisdom. Thank you uncle, I will not disappoint you. I've also gained some weight so I should start with some training too. But uncle, I don't have good men in the city that can help me. Everyone here is trying to play their own game, Robert showed his concern. I'll send some old wolf sword members, they'll take over the city management and the city watch. They will work directly under John and the king. They are also hardened warriors, trained by me, so they are very strong and loyal to, Alexander offered. He wasn't really going to send his wolf swords. The elves were much more valuable than that. He was just going to send some old looking godroids. That is an amazing offer, uncle. Please send them here as soon as possible. Robert excitedly replied. He was more excited thinking that he might be able to clash swords with people trained by Alexander. You should also prepare for tomorrow's public execution. People are very angry at gold cloaks, you know, Alexander warned. Yes, I'll also publicly apologize to them tomorrow. I failed them all, Robert said seriously. The next day, everyone had gathered on the execution platform. I know that I have not treated you right, my people. My ignorance has caused you all many hardships. But no more. I promise to be a better king to all of you. Janos and the other four city watch members have been sentenced to death. This is also a warning to other gold cloaks. Do what you are hired for, because if any of you are caught doing something illegal, then the punishment will be death. My uncle here, Lord Stark has also promised that he will send some very capable men to take the command of the city watch. I will also give some more money to repair the flea bottom and turn it into a clean and normal part of King's Landing, Robert addressed the crowd. Then Robert himself took the sword and beheaded the five men. The four men who had beaten the little girl were also Lannisters. Alexander was waiting to see what Tewin's reply would be. After that, they proceeded to the small council. There were two seats that were empty now, the master of coins and the grand maester. Pisel had suddenly fallen from stairs and broken his neck some hours ago. No one mourned for him. So, what are we going to do about the debt we owe to Lord Tewin? John spoke. Simple, just put the blame on his daughter, the queen. Say that she spent it all on herself. If he asks where Robert got money to spend on wine and women, just say that it was my money. But how much money are we talking about? Alexander asked. 500,000 gold dragons, John replied. Oh, that's fine then. It's not that much. Now, I want to talk about your bastards, Robert. You have to take them in. They are your responsibility. They have your own blood running in their veins. Don't disgrace your family line by disowning them. There's even a little boy who looks exactly like you when you were younger, he seriously said. How many are there? Robert embarrassingly asked. Three. One is Maya Stone and lives in Airy. Bella Rivers, lives with a prostitute in Peach. Gendry Waters is a small babe in King's Landing. They are your true-born children, Robert. He replied. What do you mean by true? Come on, Robert. We all know you have some doubts about Joffrey and Marcella's birth. To be honest, we all have. They don't even look a tad bit like you. Everything about them speaks Lannister Alexander scoffed. But Pycelle said that Lannister blood was more dominant so they have Lannister features, John retorted. He knew it was all bullshit but he wanted to see Alexander's reaction. Ha, huh, who said it? The guy who was practically sharing a bed with Tywin? Pycelle would have done anything to keep the Lannisters happy. Still, we should keep our doubts to ourselves. We have no proof yet and we don't want to baselessly accuse someone and start a war. Robert, you should treat the children like you always do. Even if they are not yours, it wasn't their fault that they were born. Just like your bastards. He said to Robert, keeping eye contact with him. He cast some long-lasting compulsion charms to make him treat children like a normal father would. Get angry when they do something wrong and happy when something good. Okay, I'll heed to your advice. I'll also send my bastards to Stormlands and give them a nice life. Robert said, I have a better option. Send them to Winterfell. We have many children there and three more won't cause a problem. Your eldest, Maya Stone, is nearly the same age as Myrina, they'll become good friends, Alexander offered. Then it's decided. I'll send them to Winterfell. I still remember Maya. She was a good girl, I even thought of bringing her to Red Keep after Joffrey was born. But Cersei I threatened to hurt her. Robert angrily said. Good, now to other matters. Your youngest brother is not qualified enough to either be the Lord of Stormlands or the Master of Law here. He needs more experience and training. He's still 14 names day old. Send him to some warrior house to get fostered. In the meantime, make Stannis the Lord of Stormlands. He is a good military man and can rule. You can give the Master of Law position to someone else. Alexander advised. Robert and Stannis didn't have very good relations but Alexander saw them for what they were. He had to use some magic to make Robert agree. All right, Stannis. You're the new Lord of Stormlands. I am sending Renly to that Tower of Knowledge in Winter City to learn lording and fighting. John, what about Tywin? Did he send a raven? I know Cersei I must have told him about yesterday's happenings Robert looked at his lord hand. No, we. Knock knock. 
Jamie Lannister entered, Your Grace, there's a raven for Lord Stark. Alexander stood up and took it parchment. Thank you, he opened it, haha, it's from Tywin. He said that his daughter's words are not to be taken as his words. He also said that if any more Lannisters break laws then they be sent to Westerlands to face punishment. He still wants to save his men, Robert roared. He said they be sent back, but not how. You can break their arms and legs for their crimes before sending them, Stannis added. Damn, good advice Stannis, Robert praised. Okay, we should end this meeting. I also need to leave for some work. I'll see you sometime again Robert. If you need to immediately contact me then you should tell my men in the city, he said. See you soon, Uncle Robert hugged him. Haha, <laughs> lose some weight, boy, Alexander said and laughed. Let's hope Robert doesn't spoil things up now chapter 70, 70. Darker side of the world. Alexander stood on the deck of Yamato warship. The fleet was heading towards Karth. He and Dobby were going to go ahead and deal with the city's defenses. Those who deserve to die would die. He was going to dissolve all merchant groups of Karth and combine them into his merchant guild. There would not be any new ruler in the city but a governor appointed by Winterfell. Pureborn of Karth ruled from the Hall of a Thousand Thrones, the warlocks of Karth have their center of power in the House of the Undying. These two would be fully destroyed. The House of Undying and its warlocks would be given death and the Pureborn would be judged. He had seen enough bullsh asterisk t about pure blood supremacy in Harry Potter and knew that they could not be normally treated. The Merchant Guild, 13, the Tourmalin Brotherhood, and the Ancient Guild of Spicers will be dealt with too. Let's go Dobby he and Dobby went to Karth through the anywhere door. It was morning and various activities had just started. Shops were slowly opening. He had told Dobby to go and deal with the Pureborns in the Hall of Thousand Thrones while he deals with the House of Undying. You can see Karth and House of Undying on illustration channel of my Discord, https colon slash slash discord.gg slash dghcron. Or see them on Instagram, https colon slash slash www.instagram.com slash Mr. Underscore Immortal Underscore Novel. He calmly walked the streets. It was a really colorful city if one were to ignore all the darkness hidden in there. After I'm done, this will really become the most colorful city. The House of Undying was really a creepy place. There were no other buildings near it. The main building also looked like a crumbling stone ruin. He walked to the door and knocked on it. A wraith-like man came out. His lips were blue due to drinking the shade of the evening. I am Alexander Stark from West Eros. I want to meet the Undying Ones. He straightforwardly stated. You must drink the shade of the evening before entering, so you may hear and see the truth. He said and gave him a glass. Why would they ignore the request of a big lord from West Eros? Oh really, I'm pretty sure this is a hallucinogen he thought. He took the glass and acted like drinking it. In reality, all the shade of the evening was being sent to his pocket dimension. Then he used slight magic to turn his lips blue. Follow me, the wraith said and led him in. Alexander quickly checked his sins. Piet Pri, Category 3. Murder, 3788. Blood Sacrifice, 98. All Children. Dark Rituals, 286. Sin Percentage 70%. He's borderline 4th category. He's not even one of the undying ones. How many sins would they have committed, he thought and turned serious. Piet took him somewhere deep underground and stopped in front of a big black door. He signaled to him to go inside. Alexander calmly opened the door and went inside. It was a big dark hall. In the middle was a table around which ten men sat. They all looked even uglier than Darth Sidious. Their bodies were bluish too. He quickly looked at their sins and sure enough, all of them were category 4. Some were just a few decimal points away from category 5. They all were hundreds of years old. The magic they used to prolong their life involved slowly taking out blood from children and drinking it with the shade of the evening. They had killed slash eight thousands of child slaves which they bought from the slaver's bay. Easy to say, just dying was too little of a punishment for them. Alexander decided to stop acting like a respectful lord and start acting like the god's advocate. He waved his hand and a nice golden throne materialized on the empty side of the table. He calmly walked up to it and sat down. Why you are like us. I can feel your power. Such magic. I want it. One of them screeched. Don't you dare to consider me like you. I don't kill babies to get stronger. Alexander angrily spoke. He waved his hand and the metal chair the ugly man was sitting on, transfigured. The chair now had various tight cuffs and buckles holding him. Not just him but every other undying one. I'll start with you. I don't even want to look in your mind. I know it's as filthy as Morgan Ellie Faye's, if not more. Then the man's body started burning. But every time his body burned, it also healed up. It was Alexander's way of torturing him physically. The man was also going through time torture in his brain. He was not burning there too but also getting stabbed by each person he killed. He went through 500 years of torture in his mind while in the real world, his body burned for an hour. The other warlocks were trying to free themselves but couldn't. They tried to use various kinds of magic but nothing helped. This is the doom of the House of Undying. The cult that you have created over the dead bodies of an unquantifiable number of people will end today. Ha ha ha. We warlocks are spread all around the world. You cannot end us by just killing the ten of us. They will come after you and your family. You have doomed your own house, Alexander Stark. One of them said. Then I'll kill you all as his words fell, they all started to burn and go through 500 years of time torture. Oxio Suprema Warlocks, 
he silently chanted. One by one, about 2,300 warlocks popped into that room. The moment they appeared their bodies became paralyzed. Alexander checked all of them for their sins and they all deserved death. Their whole cult was based on dark magic. He didn't even feel like using them like what he did with Lucius in the past world. He already had the purest brings, elves, to help him. He gave them the same punishment. May God not have mercy on your souls, he said and left the room to see what secrets the building held. He wanted to see the rooms that showed the visions. He was not disappointed. There were runes inscribed on the floor. He also felt that there was something mixed in the air. Then the visions started to kick in. Vision 1, Olivia, look at our sons. They helped me make the medicine and save you. The world loves them. Alexander happily said, sitting on a sofa with an old woman in his arms. TV showed his sons giving an interview. Yes, Alex. They are the best thing to ever happen to us she replied and gave his old wrinkled face a gentle kiss. But, there were tears in Alexander's eyes. Then suddenly everything turned white. Vision 2, I am. Inevitable he only heard a heavy voice and the vision changed again. Vision 3, what's your name, son? Alexander inquired. A small, malnourished blonde boy replied, Stephen Grant Rogers, sir. Vision 4, it showed him being stuck in a death loop. The area around him was all black and whenever he res beyond his body would painfully disfigure and die. The process repeated for hundreds of times before the vision ended. Vision 5, ah, we missed you so much all these years, grandpa. Hermione cried with Edward standing behind her. Vision 6, it showed him in a castle made of ice. The people living in it all looked as white as ice. There were some kids too. They all looked sad and weak. Vision 7, and I, am. Iron M he could only hear that much before he felt something trying to break into his mind. He fought the invasion. He shielded his mind to 100% and looked around for the source of the invasion. After a while of searching, he finally found it. It was a tree. A tree with consciousness. He used his eye of judgment on it. The ancient tree of death, category 5. Murder by sucking up the life force while showing visions, 1,876,989. Sin percentage, 97%. This is pure evil. Demonic. No wonder, not many people come out of the house of undying alive. I must kill this thing. He used his eye powers to erase it. The golden flames came out of his eyes and attached themselves to the tree. The tree started making shrieking noises before turning into nothingness. Not even ashes remained. Once the tree was gone, he felt that the strange air particles in the air were gone too. What were those visions? Olivia didn't get cancer? Hermione and Edward. Damn it, I should not think about them. Prophecies and visions can never be trusted he reprimanded himself and walked away to search other places. In most of the places, he didn't find anything and kept on searching. Finally, he came to a large hall that looked like a sacrificial ceremony place. But the room was empty. He carefully looked around and found a secret door behind a big portrait. He opened it and went inside. There were some traps as well but nothing he couldn't handle. The stairs led further down and in the end, he found two doors. He went into one and found a lot of gold, jades, and other valuables. Then he walked into the other room. The horrors he saw in the room made his scalp numb. He felt sweat dripping from his temples. Then his mouth left a long sigh. A long sigh filled with rage, exhaustion, and sorrow. How can one human do this to another, to children? He questioned himself. In front of him were hundreds of small cages. In them were nearly a thousand children. From toddlers to little babies. They were tightly overpacked in each cage. What made it worse was that there was no noise. He didn't know if they were fed something so he looked into one's memory. The child was so scared when he was brought here, and when he was locked in the cage. He had given up on the will to live. He had accepted that no good thing could come. He was the son of a slave woman. He remembered the face of his mother before he was separated from her and sold. All the children in the room were brought there a week ago and had not been fed anything. Many were on the brink of death. Alexander quickly cast wide area healing spells with 100% of his divine magic. He also conjured thousands of godroids and made them tend to each child. Feed them potions. Be it rejuvenation or blood replenishing. Maybe. This world really is beyond retribution. I should just end everything and leave he thought in self-doubt. But then he suddenly remembered the smiling faces of little Rena, Alexandra, John, Eric, and many more good people. I cannot do that. If I did, then I'd be even worse than the demons. But I must quicken my efforts he said to himself. Barry, come out. Help the children here. He called him out. Barry didn't come alone though. He brought 13 other phoenixes with him. They all flew around, dropping tears in some children's mouths and singing something to lighten the tension. Oh yeah, yeah. Alexander heard the first wail of a child since he entered the room. Then he suddenly remembered something. He quickly operated to the room where all the warlocks were still burning. He increased their time torture to 10,000 years. He then returned to the children. Many had started to look around in confusion. Alexander cast a cheering charm and gently spoke to them all. My children, don't be afraid anymore. I've come to save you all. The bad people who brought you here have already been caught and punished. I am Alexander Stark. You all can call me grandpa. I will take care of you all. You can play, eat, and sleep all you want in my place. Then he opened the anywhere door which led straight to the biggest orphanage in the Seven Kingdoms. It could house 5,000 children. Thousands of nanny bots worked around the clock there to help them. 
Once they settle down, they will be given lessons too. Children looked at the magical door in amusement. Alexander waved his hand and each kid had a lollipop in their hand. Follow me kiddies, he warmly said and entered the door. On the other side, Rina was playing with some orphan kids in the yard of the orphanage when the magical door suddenly opened. She looked curiously at it but didn't go near it. Then Alexander came out of it, followed by 1078 kids. Why? So many new friends, Rina loudly gasped, making Alexander chuckle. Chapter 71, 71. Lion on move. After he was done with settling the children down and telling Alina to oversee the situation, he returned to the house of Undying. He walked outside the building and cast a powerful fiend fire. He burned the building right to the ashes. He also noticed that the empty area around the now burnt house of Undying had again started to grow small plants. Maybe, it was that ancient tree of death, sucking out the life off the earth around it. Alexander helped the plants grow and turned the area into a small jungle. This was by far the worst experience Alexander had gone through since he arrived in the world. He was now wondering, if Karth was this bad then what about other places? Boss, I'm done with the pureborns. Most of them were involved in slavery. I had to kill them. The remaining were obliviated. However, I also found a man who was trying to start a revolution and take over the city. I read his mind. He wanted to banish slavery. Dobby reported him. What's his name? Alexander asked. Francisco, he's not from here, Dobby answered. All right, let's go and meet the guy. After that, we'll deal with the merchant guilds they operate to the Hall of Thousand Thrones. Dobby took him to a young man, probably in his twenties. So, you are the man Dobby talked about. Why do you want to free the city? He asked. Because I saw injustice happen here. From where I am from, we are told to rise up to help those in need, Francisco solemnly replied. Noble ideals you have there. Where are you from? I am from Carcassa, it is located on the southeastern shore of the Hidden Sea within the mountains of the Morn, Francisco answered. Oh, so you're from the further east. I've heard that your ruler is a sorcerer lord claiming to be the 69th Yellow Emperor of Yeti. Is that real? Yes, he is a sorcerer, but not like the warlocks or ones in Asai. He calls himself a light sorcerer. He cares for all his people too. Enough about me, what are you going to do with Karth now? He questioned. Well, we've taken the city. I've destroyed the house of undying. Pureborns are gone. I am going to banish slavery. No king or prince will sit here. A governor appointed by me will run the city, by my orders, Alexander briefly answered. If what you say is true, then I have nothing to worry about. Your name is quite famous, Lord Stark. The oppressed people of Karth quite admire the way you treat non-nobility in your kingdom. Francisco praised. Ha ha ha. Stop flattering me now, kid. What will you do now? Wanna join me in organizing this city? Alexander asked. No, I and my friends would rather go somewhere else where we can help people. My work here is already done. Thanks to you. He gave a slight bow. Good, take this coin. If someday, you are in need of help, show it to a northern naval soldier or merchant. They will help and even bring you to me if need be. I wish you good luck Alexander handed him a dark silver coin. Francisco put the coin safely in his pocket and left the hall to his next destination. It took him another day to fully consolidate his hold on the city. He let the news out that Alexander Stark had taken over the city. When 13, Tourmaline Brotherhood, the ancient guild of Spicers, and the Sorrowful Men found out about it, they revolted. Though their revolt only lasted a few minutes before Alexander minesweeped them all and separated them. Those that were in late stage 3 were dealt with. Those that were in category 2 or very early 3 were given 100 years of time torture and lessons on how to be a good addition to society. Among these groups, sorrowful men were the worst. They were an ancient guild of assassins. Before killing their targets they would say I am so sorry. They took contracts to kill anyone they were asked for. Their end was the same as the House of Undying. The three merchant guilds though, after the time torture, they all became better. Alexander dissolved their groups and included them in the Northern Merchant Guild, they all were also made to sign a binding contract to never deal with slaves. Then he announced that the Karth was now an overseas territory of House Stark of Winterfell. His fleet that was stationed there was named the Liberation Fleet. He also placed an additional four Yamato warships there to keep Jade Gates secure. Slavery was also abolished from there and punishment for trading slaves was death. As he also controlled the Jade Gates he could also stop other slavers from selling people to further east, in Yeti, Asai, and Shadowlands. He was also going to deal with the Slaver's Bay soon enough. For now, the port city of Karth was being called the 10th Free City of Essos. Though he knew that the other free cities were free only in name. They also practiced slavery secretly. So, how's everything? What is the reaction of common people? He asked Dobby. They are taking this pretty easily. They are a bit shocked at how you took over without spilling blood. There were some voices calling for revolt, but they were obliviated. We are encouraging free trade now. Hopefully, things will return to normal in a week. He replied. Nice, I want you to keep an eye on the reaction of the Lords of West Eros. In the meantime, I'll check out ETI, Asai, and the legendary Stagai, Haunted Corpse City. Maybe, I'll trigger some big memories there. You will, I cannot tell you much but you will find about your past in this world. If you visit Valeria after all that, you'll completely know about your past. This is as much I can tell, Dobby informed. Alexander nodded, this is helpful. I really wanna know, why the world is still so messed up. 
The news traveled fast, at least with the weekly newspaper that the North publishes. The newspaper was called, The Planetos, it was widely circulated around West Eros and some parts of Essos. It usually had all the weekly news that happened around the world. The world found out about the recent successful conquest of Alexander Stark. Casterly Rock. T. Win Lannister sat in his workroom with his two brothers. Reading the newspaper, I can smell big ambitions from this man. Taking over Karth with such ease, T. Win spoke. What does he want? He's already the strongest in terms of everything. Does he want the Iron Throne? Kevin interjected. Haha. You won't understand what he just did if you haven't sailed the seas. You have no idea how hard it is to take over Karth. They are very strong and don't forget their warlocks either. But by far the biggest thing is Jade Gates. Now, Starks will control the trade throughout the world and will make more money than we can imagine. Though I'm happy that he abolished slavery. Jerrion spoke in his always happy face. Yes, you are right, Jerrion. North was already impenetrable with all their defenses. Now they are invincible. If someone attacks them, they can simply destroy their trade. We must do something. The lion must make a move. T. Win said, not letting much out. I hope you won't do something that we'll regret, Jerrion straightforwardly said. And I don't need advice from the family joker, T. Win coldly retorted. Sons pair, Dorn. Still don't want to talk to Lord Stark? It's probably only him who can help us get justice. Don't forget how angry he had gotten with Robert in the throne room that day. Oberyn persuaded his brother. Now he has reconciled with the usurper, Doran replied. Seriously, even I can see that what Lord Stark did was to save the realm from Lannisters. You weren't the one who talked to Rena. That little girl told me some things about Lord Stark. He's a man of honor and justice. He's a man who if sees something bad happening, would jump to help without thinking twice, and now, all of West Arrows fear him. Oberyn retorted. What he heard from Rena about Alexander taking in hundreds of orphans and sheltering them, made him see Alexander in another light. Still, we should wait longer. I don't want to cause our demise due to some foolish decision, Doran calmly responded. When? When will that Dornish blood boil? How long will Elias murderers roam freely? You should be ashamed of calling yourself her brother, Oberyn angrily yelled and left. He had enough of it. The newspapers had reported multiple times about more crimes being committed by Gregor Cleagany and Amory Lorch. Chapter 72, 72. Memories from Asai. Anywhere door was a very convenient gadget. Alexander went to Asai through it. The city was extremely big with big building structures. He couldn't imagine how it was created. The buildings had a deep black color and seemed to absorb the little light that fell on the city. But the surrounding air spoke about the nature of the city. Depressing and dark. Most of the streets were always empty and those people that he saw also covered their bodies. The sky above was so black that it allowed close to no sunlight inside the city. He wondered what might have caused it. Even the river flowing through the land was poisonous. He calmly walked the streets, judging anyone he saw. Till now, he hadn't been able to find someone below category 3. He then became invisible and started investigating. The city allowed anything and everything, from dark to evil practices. Worshipping of any god. He surprisingly found that the biggest temple in the city was dedicated to him, All Father, so he thought about checking it out. Inside, he found so many sculptures of himself that it gave him a headache. But by far the strangest and the biggest of them was at the end of the hall. It had various small sculptures kneeling in front of him. The small ones were not just humans either. Weird humanoid beings were there. Including white walkers. Then he felt it, inside his head. Like a lock being opened. A lot of information rushed into his brain. Memory. 15,000 years ago. There was another red-colored moon in the sky, it was smaller than the other, normal one. Where he stood looked like Asai, but not black or dark. It looked like a flourishing city, a city that he made after advancing people from cave-dwelling barbarians to current knowledgeable society. But then, the red moon started to fall. Having no other way of saving people, Alexander used his powers to the fullest. He flew to the sky and used the strongest blasting curse to obliterate the moon. But sadly, he didn't know that it was filled with strange black liquid. Feeling the dangerous black substance falling on Earth. He quickly evacuated as many people as he could. Most of the part of the falling moon had gone away from Earth, though still in orbit, a lot of its dark liquid fell on Earth. Mainly the Shadowlands. Wherever it fell, the black liquid integrated itself with the object. The ancient city of Asai turned black. The grounds around it turned black. The river became poisoned. The sky above it turned black and some people died. Another large part of the liquid fell on the cursed island, west of West Eros. The whole island turned black due to it and created mutations in the aboriginal human tribes and animals. It also created various dangerous diseases. Due to some reasons, the island started to have extreme storms in a radius of thousands of miles around it, making the island inaccessible. Another small part of it fell in Sothorios, on an abandoned city. The city also turned black and poisonous. The tribes living around it mutated to mindless cannibal beings. Animals became more dangerous and diseases filled the land. Some broken parts of the moon also fell in various parts of the world. The moon rocks were red and had red dust at the beginning, but due to falling through the atmosphere, it turned black and harder. A huge part of it fell in West Eros, mainly Old Town. The black rock on which the high tower was built was that moon rock. To not create more destruction he used magic to put down most of the big meteorites gently. The craziest part happened after that event. 
The event created dragons. Yes, for some reason, the moon in the sky was filled with dragon eggs. Later when the eggs hatched many people started to feel magic. That was how magic came into that world. It was somehow connected to dragons or maybe the moon. Those dragons that hatched in the north became ice dragons and due to harsher climate were bigger and more ferocious, they spit blue cold flames. The ones in the south were normal dragons with red hot flames. The seasons on the planet also started to become uneven since then. All this happened even before the Empire of Dawn was made. Seeing that he caused so much damage to the world albeit unknowingly, he dedicated the next few thousand years to making new cities and making humans prosper. He then finally took over a large region and officially created the Empire of Dawn. Alexander didn't know that he was in the world of Game of Thrones at that time. To him, he was in some random fantasy world. Memory ends. Holy, this explains so much. For example, no real clue of how the dragons came to be. No clue about how the Shadowlands became Shadowlands. The red comet that appears in the sky is also probably some debris from the obliterated moon still somewhere around the planet. But why was the moon filled with dragon eggs? Alexander found some answers but also got a bit more confused. He looked at his big sculpture. He still didn't get any clue about why so many different species were portrayed as kneeling to him. Father sure made all this interesting. But let's get to business. I need to purify this land. I don't know if I can remove that black liquid from the surroundings though. He started remembering things to small details. Things that he did to purify the land in the past. In the end, he concluded that he had tried everything he could come up with right now. Arg, what should I do? He scratched his head in frustration. Wait, what if I do the same thing I did with Horcruxes? I put the whole shadow lands in my space pocket for a split second. But to not kill the people, I'll have to put the shadow lands on an uninhabited planet in my solar system. Yes, this sounds nice. He loudly talked to himself. He flew high in the hair, even above the black clouds. When he was in clear sky he threw a wide area confusion charm and quickly put the whole shadow lands in his space pocket. In a split second, it appeared again. But this time, without black clouds stopping the sunlight. The ground became a normal sandy color and the river became normal too. But the buildings were still black. So, Alexander just painted them all white. Now, it looked like some awesome Greek-styled fantasy city. He looked around for people and surprisingly some had vanished. He guessed that they probably got purified too. But there was one thing he hadn't thought about. His actions had caused a tsunami in the Jade Sea. He had to work a lot more to bring things back to normal. Haha. <laughs> and now I have another city under me. It's pure too. Most of the slaves have been left masterless as their masters got purified. I should bring Dobby to organize this he said to himself. Boss, I've assigned godroids to the whole city. 10,000 more of them were sent out to survey the whole of Shadowlands. If everything turns out right, I suggest we turn all the unused land into farmland. The weather in this area is perfect for various kinds of fruits and crops. Dobby suggested. Nice, then let's do that. I think that we're going to have a population boom in the world after all the changes I am making. So we should start preparing the food. Also, appoint a governor here and produce another fleet of 250 ships with Mecha Maker. With this final fleet, we'll have the whole world covered. Alexander instructed. But what about, east of Essos and west of West Eros? Also, Sothorios and Ultos? Dobby asked. Well, I know what's west of West Eros. There's a crazy reverse storm there. If you somehow cross that storm then you'll come out into the Sunrise Seas, which leads to right here. Sothorios is probably a huge continent with various mysteries, which I'll uncover later. Ultos is the same as Sothorios. Also, I think that Sothorios and Ultos are connected. At least that's what it looked like from space, Alexander answered. Okay, boss. Where are you going next? Dobby asked. Yeti, but first. I'm going back to teach Rena archery. She must already be angry at me he said with a wide smile on his face. He took out the anywhere door and crossed it. On the other side, he found his precious little Rena, watching Tom and Jerry with other children in the Stark's living room. Rena, I am back, he loudly said. Rena's ears stood up as soon as she heard his voice. She looked towards him with a very excited face and nearly jumped towards him. But then she remembered that she was angry at him. I am not talking to grandpa she pouted and puffed her chubby cheeks. Oh, but why? Alexander asked, shedding some fake tears. You promised to teach me how to use a bow, but you never came, she replied. Ah, my sweetie, I am sorry. How about I make it up to you? I'll take you with me the next time I go away. We'll travel to the far eastern kingdom of Yeti, Alexander suggested. Why aaa, really? She exclaimed with stars shining in her eyes. Yes, grandpa promise. He gave her his pinky finger and made the kid's version of the unbreakable vow. Then he suddenly caught her and tickled her. Ha 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 ha, grandpa, ha ha ha, I will tickle you too. She started trying to tickle him but instead pulled his beard. They played for the next hour or so with other kids too. Little John was the quick one and Alexandra was the cheerful one. She would laugh at nearly anything. Eric was more of a calm boy but still naughty. Chapter 73, 73. Memories from the Dawn Part 1. The next day, Alexander brought little Rena with him to ETI. She was greatly excited to see a new kingdom. They crossed the anywhere door while being invisible. When they came out on the other side, they were greeted by a flourishing market. So many people were walking the streets. Many were wearing straw hats. 
The building and scenery looked like he was in some mythical ancient Chinese world. Tall pagoda-like buildings were everywhere. The people also looked a bit like Eastern Asians and they wore clothes like in ancient China. He flew around with Rina in his arms, looking around the cities. He was surprised by the sheer scale of the cities in Yiti. There were so many of them and all were of the same or bigger size than Norgold. The palace of the god emperor was also bigger than the whole king's landing. But each city he visited, he also found his temples. They were crowded with people too. And all of them were similar to the ones in Asai. Why do people in the east worship me so much, he thought to himself. Then, once again, he had a memory resurface. This was a lot bigger than the last one. Memory. After what happened in Asai, he created the Empire of Dawn and then trained a boy to become its emperor. At that time, the city was inhabited by nearly the majority of the world's population. But not all of them lived there. Some chose to go to the now dark Asai to practice magic as the magic was stronger there. Maybe due to that strange liquid, in later years, many types of magic came into existence. Blood magic, necromancy. Due to prolonged exposure to that dark city and weird magic, some humans mutated into weird creatures. For example, bloodless men, winged men, etc. The city had turned into a hub for dark magic. That is the only kind of magic that was in the world. Alexander didn't stop them from practicing it but he put strict rules. Like no innocent person should be hurt because of magic and that no child should be hurt either. All the sorcerers accepted his words. Why wouldn't they? They worshipped him as their supreme god. Even more so after he made the Empire of Dawn. The emperor that Alexander had installed in the empire was also hailed as the god on earth or the son of all father. Alexander gave the emperor enough elixirs for him to live for thousands of years. Things went well for a long time under him. The human population started to heavily expand to other parts of the world. A large group of the humans migrated from the Empire of Dawn and headed to the southwestern part of the Essos, they called themselves the first men after they crossed the Arm of Dorn and ventured into West Eros. Another big group headed to the northwestern part of the Essos and settled there. They developed their own simplified writing scripts derived from the Kingdom of Dawn. They called themselves Undals. Later another large group of people traveled west and settled around the banks of the River Ronyi. They became river-faring people. Then another large group went to the Midwest and established the Dothraki Seas. But this time they weren't murdering bandits. They were still wild and crazy but also a little bit civilized. They didn't hurt women and children and the elderly, they offered them to join them. They still steal though. They also started a practice of electing a king among themselves by Kalasar fighting each other in 1v1. All these people combined, created the population of Essos. Many new cities were created and many fell. The population increased rapidly. But still, there was one thing very common among all these people. They worshipped Alexander as the supreme god. Many of them had made up new gods for themselves like the seven or the old gods but still, they all acknowledged the fact that the All-Father was one above all. Hence in every temple or sept, they made for a god, there would be a place to worship him too. They made big statues of Alexander and they were very accurate as well. Long hair and beard with loose robes. A book in one hand and a great sword in the other. They worshipped him as the supreme god of creation and destruction and also believed that the other gods were also his creation, but they refrained from openly praying to him as they believed that Alexander was too holy and should not be disturbed for petty wishes. Rather, they prayed to smaller gods in the hope that their words would reach the one above all. Another reason for that practice was that there were many records of the Supreme One descending to the world when a worshipper worshipped directly when they were in a dire need of help, for example in mortal danger. There were also records of Supreme One punishing the evil men who wished evil things from him. Over time, many new names were given to him, but the one that circulated the most was All Father. Everything was going well until the god on earth, Emperor of Dawn died. For some next generations, his descendants rightfully ruled the empire but each new rule lasted less than before and brought more turmoil. Then Amethyst Empress, was murdered by the Bloodstone Emperor. He then began a reign of terror and slavery on the people. He started practicing dark arts and necromancy, took a tiger woman, mutated girl, for his bride, feasted on human flesh and cast down the gods of Yeti, Alexander, to worship a black stone fallen from the sky, a part of the moon that Alexander destroyed. The event was later called Blood Betrayal, in the annals of the further east. Then, the long night came. Back then, Essos was connected to the north aka the land of always winter. It connected with the cold ice desert called Grey Waste in Essos. The others slash white walkers were very strong. Even though they numbered less, as they marched closer, the world got colder. You can see full theorized map of planetos on illustration channel of my discord, https colon slash slash discord dot gg slash dghcron. Or see them on Instagram, https colon slash slash www dot instagram dot com slash mr underscore immortal underscore novel. The cold spread throughout Essos. Mothers died in their sleep while hiding their babies in their arms. The Bloodstone Emperor soon died of unknown reasons with his wife. The Empire fell into a panic. The remaining descendants of the God on Earth fought each other for the throne with backstabbing, treachery, playing their games for the throne even in that dire situation. The common people, the nobles, the intelligent beasts, all started to pray to the Supreme One, to come and save them from the long night. Alexander was exploring Sothorios at the time, but he did feel their prayers and responded. Alexander came down from the sky engulfed in a majestic fire shaped like a phoenix. 
When he touched the ground all the cold in the kingdom vanished. The people knelt on the ground enchanted prayers. Various beautiful songs from strange birds filled the sky. That moment was later described as the rise of the sun in some holy scriptures of the ETI. O Supreme One, please save us, some old man shouted. Mercy, 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 they chanted. There were about a million people and their shouting made the ground shake. Alexander raised his hand for all of them to stop. All of you have suffered enough. After saying that, he cast a wide area healing spell. All the people suddenly started to feel better. Those who were shivering in the cold stopped shivering. Children who had stopped crying due to a lack of energy started to cry again. Everyone realized that is was doing of the God King. It was a blessing directly given to them. Tell me who is the strongest, the most righteous and intelligent fighter among you, he asked. The people looked confused for a while but then an old man looked up from his kneeling position. O oh, Supreme One, there's only one boy with the qualities you speak of, he is known as Arthur Dane. He is the first sword of the empire. Arthur Dane, come forward he ordered. A six feet tall boy about 25 years old, dark hair with violet eyes and fair skin came running to him and kneeled. Stand up child, I grant this great sword called Dawn to you. You will wield it and lead the fighters to fight the long night. From now on, you will be called Arthur Dane, the sword of the morning. You are the hero, the Azor Aha. Arthur took the sword and kneeled on the ground once again with his sword pointed into the ground and both his hands on its hilt. Alexander then put his palm on Arthur's head. You have my blessings. As he said those words, the sword started burning with red fire. All the people around gasped and once again started chanting prayers and the name of their new hero. All of you must be hungry he waved his hands and a huge wooden pot filled with stew appeared near him. With another wave, a huge basket filled with bread appeared. Another wave and a wooden plate appeared in the hands of every person there. Considering that there were about a million people there, he made many more huge pots and baskets appear at every 100 meter distance. As long as the long night is here, you will get stew and bread from that basket and pot. Each of you is allowed to eat three times a day. The day the long night will be defeated, the basket, the pot, and all the plates will disappear along with me. From that day onwards, you will work hard and build the city once again and start a new life. The granaries will be filled to their limit when I leave. It's on you how you use it. However, fear not, I am not abandoning you. I'll always be watching, I am everywhere. Arthur, tell the soldiers to maintain public order and then come to me at the border of the Grey Waste. He ordered. Yes, Supreme One. I will fulfill the command, Arthur stiffly replied. Alexander left the place and went to the Grey Waste. Sigh, if I knew that those Eisman would do this, I would have helped them sooner, Alexander said to himself. Chapter 74, 74. Memories from the Dawn Part 2. A day later, Arthur reached the border of the Grey Waste. Supra. Just call me all father, that would be more practical. I watch over you, protect you, and sometimes even feed you like any child's father Alexander interrupted. Arthur stayed silent for a while thinking what he just heard and indeed, Supreme One was more like a father to all the people, who always watched over them, and honestly, he also liked calling him all father than Supreme One or God King. Yes, all father. Good, now we will go and talk with the leader of those Icemen. We must hear their side of the story but before that, we must create a nice defensive line. Alexander suggested. He started waving his hand like in an orchestra and blackish stones started to come out of the ground and slowly assembled themselves into giant fortresses. It looked powerful and scary with its black color. I have created five fortresses like these between the Bleeding Sea and the Mountains of the Morn. Each fortress can house 10,000 men. They are standing at the only entrance to the Empire of Dawn and the Grey Waste so this should be enough. Now let's go and meet them. Suddenly, Alexander flew into the sky, and Arthur was also being pulled. His expressions changed from surprise to panic and finally excitement. Every man dreams of flying in the air like birds but no one could do it. Except for those winged men. They flew so fast that the world around them passed in a blur. It only took them five seconds to reach the marching army of the Eisman aka the others or White Walkers. Alexander came down to the ground like thunder, surprising everyone. The army of the Eisman was surprisingly more full of animals than their supposed masters. The humanoid Eisman hastily got off the backs of their steeds and kneeled. They looked much different from what they looked on the TV show. They had plain white skin and white hair. No one could say that they weren't humans if not for the extreme cold aura their bodies emitted. God King, thank you for blessing us with your presence, the one with a lion face said, in their culture, Alexander was called God King. The Iceman had the body of a human but the head of a lion, possibly a victim of some blood magic. Alexander knew how the others slash white walkers came into being. Their creation was a tragedy and their lives were even more of a tragedy. In the beginning, they were just normal humans living in the cold north, but the appearance of magic mutated them. What is your name? Alexander asked. They call me the Lion of the Night, but my real name is Hagar, he answered. Okay Hagar, tell me, why are you marching your armies to the land of summer? Do you know how many people have died because of this? Alexander questioned in anger. Hagar shivered in fear but managed to speak. Please forgive me God King, but I had no intention of hurting anyone. We are just looking for dragons. It's our curse that wherever we go the cold follows. Hagar honestly answered. Why are you looking for dragons? He inquired. Because we have no other choice. Survival in the frozen land has become very hard for us now. The ice dragons hunt us like we are ants. 
We tried many times to tame them or kill them but they were too strong. The biggest one that I have seen was 100 meters long. Our only hope to fight them is if we can get some dragons from here and use them. Hagar answered. How many of you are left there? 400 men including, 200 of us here and an additional 200 sent to the other side where the south and north connects. We have more than 2,000 women and 300 children. As we cannot biologically reproduce we take orphaned newborn children from the south and give them a new family. The men's numbers are less than women's because only us men go to fight the dragons. Alexander felt pity for them. They were a species on the brink of extinction. All they wanted was dragons but were misunderstood as demons sent by angry gods. The dragons came to the world because of him, so he decided to help them. Okay Hagar, if I make the ice dragons disappear, then would you go back? Yes. Yes, we will happily go back, God King. Hagar excitedly said. In his eyes, if God King deals with the dragons himself, then more of his people would not need to die. Okay, go back then, by the time you will reach the frozen land I'd have already dealt with the dragons. I will see you in your city then. You should also call off the men you sent to the other bridge between north and south in the west. Sorry God King, but we do not have the means to communicate with them. They have been gone for a year now and we expected them to take at least three years to reach their destination. Hagar added. Okay, you send your fastest men to tell them to stop their strike. They will hopefully be able to stop them before anything bad happens. Yes, I will do it right away, God King. All Father, what will happen now? Arthur asked seeing that the ice demons or ice men were dealt without any fight. Now, now you go back and manage the city and get things back on track and, after that, leave for the west. They might need your help. Alexander ordered and then flew back to the five fortresses with Arthur. Man these fortresses, these can be great defenses even if it's not the ice men attacking. He suggested. I'll send men here as soon as possible all father Arthur answered. All right, I must leave now. Good luck with your future fights, he flew away. Arthur just stayed there for a while, kneeling in a knightly pose. Even though they didn't have knighthood in Essos he still felt like doing that. Unknown to Alexander, all he did that day would be remembered for a long, long time. The faith of the people in the Supreme One, the God King, the All-Father would grow even more. After that, Alexander defeated all the ice dragons in the north and sent them to Drachium to learn how to be a good dragon. Then he went deep into the north, to the city of Frozen Winter, the seat of the King of Icemen. To call their lives harsh was an understatement. They were simple beings with immense power. They ate whatever grew in the icy lands. The only reason they never attacked the south was because their bodies needed the cold to survive. Alexander then went to meet with Hagar. I have dealt with the ice dragons. They will never trouble you again. In fact, I can help you. I will open a big shop in your city. It will be run by a magical golem. You will be able to buy nearly anything from there. Food, clothes, modified seeds that could grow in winter, books. You can pay for all of them with any valuable thing you can find. Things like gold, diamond, jades, beautiful stones, or you can also barter the things you make. You can barter extra crops for something else or some craft you made. This will make your life better here, Alexander offered. Hagar and his associates all kneeled on the ground. Thank you. Thank you, God King. They all said. Alexander walked to Hagar and caressed his furry lion head. As soon as he touched him, the bodies of every iceman got covered in white light. You have my blessings, child. As long as you all stay good and away from corruption, you will have the ability to procreate. But the day you lose your way and start following the path of greed, you will lose it again, Alexander blessed and warned them. W. We will cherish this opportunity you have bestowed upon us, God King, Hagar sternly replied. Ha ha. Good. I shall go now. Take care, children, Alexander said and rose up in the air. While flying back to Essos, Alexander made the bridge between Essos and North start melting slowly. In a few thousand years, it would fully vanish. In West Eros, due to a losing fight with the first men, the children of the forest enslaved the powerful team of icemen that went on the search for dragons. But the children of the forest were as foolish as their names. They and the first men signed a treaty to stop the war. But then the children forgot about the enslaved icemen. When they broke free from the control of the children of the forest, they attacked them. Men died like flies under their ice spears. They were angry, enraged that someone tried to take away their freedom. But thankfully Arthur reached in time and fought their leader with his burning sword. Soon the messenger from the Lion of the Night, Hagar, also arrived and told the Icemen about what happened in Essos. In the beginning, the leader looked skeptical but soon felt elated because Arthur also explained to him about the happenings. They were still angry at the children of the forest though and as a punishment, they were to be confined into the inner forests for the rest of their lives. The first men and Icemen slash White Walkers came into an agreement that a big wall would be constructed, which would define the boundary between their land of Icemen and the land of the Summer Men. But it was not possible to make the wall and keep it from falling down. Hence Arthur suggested that they should pray to All Father. All the kings of West Eros, Bran the Builder and the Icemen prayed to their Supreme God for three whole days without stopping. And sure enough, Alexander appeared like a burst of lightning. They all kneeled in worship. Unlike Arthur, for the first men and the Icemen, it was their first time meeting him. I know why you have called me, what is your name child? He asked the leader of the Icemen. I it's Rojok, God King he replied. Okay, you start making the wall and I'll enchant it so that it may stand tall for the thousands of years to come. 
I'll get to it right away. Rojak rushed to work. Brandon Stark, or as the others call you, Bran the Builder. I want you to start making the castles with the help of giants and the children of the forest. A new order will be created to man the wall. The Order of the Night's Watch. These men will wear black, they will hold no land or castle, they shall not marry and father children. They shall always be loyal to their order and the deserters or oathbreakers will be brought to justice according to the northern laws. He decreed. All the local kings felt pressured by his mere presence. Why yes, we will follow your command, God King Brandon stuttered. For the next several years, the Iceman built the wall and the first man built the castles. Every once in a while, Alexander would come to enchant the wall. On the other hand, Arthur Dane decided to travel a bit before settling down somewhere in Dorne. Memory end. Holy moly. I've done so many things in all these years. I basically created this world. But there is more to this. I feel like this memory is not complete. Why would the Iceman attack again? He loudly said, there was so much to be answered. Who are you talking to grandpa? Rena asked, sitting in front of him and eating some rice balls from a shop in Yeti. Haha, nothing my sweetie, what does it taste like? Alexander asked and quickly took a bite from the rice ball still in her hands. Rena looked shocked, looking at him and the big missing chunk of the rice ball. Not fair, that was mine, grandpa. It was so tasty she pouted. Ha ha ha, then I'll buy you a mountain of rice balls. Come, let's go and buy some more for others and you Alexander gave her his hand to hold. Yes, we'll buy it for everyone. John, Eric, and Axandra are small so only one for them. Uncle Brandon will need 100 and, and she started mumbling and counting on her little fingers. Chapter 75, 75. Weird Merchant. The Planetos. Headline, The Old Wolf Takes Over Asai. It had been just a week since the world found out about the Starks of Winterfell striking and taking over Karth. Now, a recent report says that the Asai by the Shadow was also attacked and taken over. Now the wolves control the Jade Sea, as well as Jade Gates. It is yet to be seen what the Starks are really planning on doing. The good news is that because of the recent actions of Lord Stark, the slave trade has lessened. Now, we should keep our eyes open to see where the old wolf strikes next. By Maester Peter Parker. Sir Willem Derry put down the newspaper and looked at the little Dany. She was now one year old and able to slowly walk. The old man Ragnarok was a blessing in disguise. He never harmed her, but showered her with love. They also didn't have to worry about money or safety anymore because of him. Daenerys was happily playing with her dozens of plushy toys on the carpet. Ragnarok sat beside her and occasionally laughed. Gia pa, Dany said while giving the small dragon toy to Ragnarok. Haha. <laughs> yes yes. Just a little more and you'll be able to say grandpa he happily said and took the toy. He was very happy when the first word she spoke was to call him. Haha. <laughs> Alexander would be surprised when she suddenly calls him grandpa in their first meeting Ragnarok had been showing pictures of Alexander to Dany and also telling her stories. Robert Baratheon had turned a new leaf. He had started regularly visiting the small council since the day Alexander left. Currently, he sat in his solar, listening to some jazz from the gramophone and sipping on some fire whiskey. He had stopped drinking too much and also whoring. Knock knock. Ah. Uh, come in goddammit. You've already ruined the mood. He growled. Queen Cersei I entered with her head held high. God had given her beauty but also too much pride with it. So much so that it would sometimes come to bite her in the back later. Husband, Lord Mace Tyrell has sent back a raven. Acknowledging the betrothal of our son and his young daughter Marguerite. He will come to King's Landing soon, she said. Suddenly Robert stood up and stopped the gramophone. What did you just say? A betrothal? When did I agree to that? Why you didn't, but I thought that the crown needed to mend relations with the Tyrells, she scaredly replied. She had received slaps from Robert many times before so fear was not missing from her face. Since when did you start worrying about the crown? I thought you only worried about your perfumes and wines. Tell Mace that I am thinking about it and he doesn't need to come, Robert said, trying to keep his anger in check. But, shouldn't we? Enough, woman. Why would I marry my children to traitors? Those flowers f asteriskers can go to hell. I have the support of House Baratheon, Stark, and Vale. One of them just so happens to be the strongest and the richest. If I want to betroth my children, I'd rather do it with the children of House Stark or House Vale. Now go back to your little parties and stop using your brain, Robert angrily ordered. Cersei I knew not to anger him anymore and left. She didn't know what to do now. She was ordered to do this by her father and also understood the importance of it. How Stark now had too much power and say in the kingdom. If not for that damned old Stark, I would never sell my sweet Joffrey like this. Yes, it's all because of them she again started forming some scheme. Grandpa, what's that? Rena pointed at the distance while sitting on Alexander's shoulders. They were currently roaming the jungles of Yeti. Medusa was also getting bored so she joined him. In the end, she also had the mentality of a child and she was missing her grandpa. Her best friend, Monty the Hippogriff, also followed her. Ah, such little snakes, Medusa said and ran to pick it up. Haha, <laughs> Rena, they are basilisks. They are very deadly snakes, Alexander said. B.A. Vasisk, just like big sister Medusa, she asked. No, your big sis is more like the queen of all serpents. Y.A. Big sister, you are a queen, Rena shouted. Medusa looked back in confusion, a queen, me, haha, ha. yes, you are, aren't you the strongest serpent in the world, 
That makes you their queen, Alexander said. Wow, but where are my people? Wait, there are so many basilisks here. I'll take them as my people, she started muttering. You can, but you have to promise me to look after them and never let them harm anyone. If they do, I'll be angry, he warned. Yes, Grandpa, I'll be very careful, she said and went to look for her new subjects. Ow, I want to be a queen too, Rena sadly sighed. Alexander made her levitate in front of her. You already are a queen, you are the queen of your grandpa's heart. Look at your dress, he said and suddenly her clothes changed into a beautiful silver regal gown. A small crown also appeared on top of her head. Ha ha ha, yay, look at me. She started to move around in the air and showed off her dress to Monty. He let them play for a while. Ha ha, okay, girls, it's time to go now. Back to Winterfell Alexander clapped his hand. What? Already? Medusa complained. Well, Rena's friends are waiting for her back at Winterfell. You also need to organize your new subjects. Yes, I need to show them the dress too, Rena chirped. Yes, I am a queen now. I must take care of my subjects, Medusa said seriously, being too much into the character. After leaving Rena back in Winterfell, Alexander returned to Asai. Dobby was still organizing things there. He wanted to see if he needed something before finally heading off to Valeria to complete his memories. Hey, Dobby. How's everything? Everything's good, boss. The city was empty to begin with, and now because of your purifying it. It has even fewer people. I am going to publish an ad in the newspaper for people to migrate here. There's also a weird merchant who's been asking about you. Then there's the problem of the Arhiller, the Lord of Light Worshippers. Dobby briefed. Okay, send the merchant and I'll deal with Arhiller Worshippers. A deity that asks for human sacrifices is no god. It's a devil. He disgustedly said. All right, boss, Dobby affirmed and called for the merchant. Alexander sat in a large office in the X Hall of the Thousand Thrones. Now it was called the Stark Essos Administrative Headquarters, SEAH. A well-built man walked into the office with a big bag on his back. He had a wide smile on his face and had a jolly vibe going around. Haha. <laughs> Greetings Lord Stark, I should probably call you King Stark now, haha <laughs> the man said. Well, that would be treason, son, and I like my head too much, though they can't really fight me even if I do declare myself king. So, I heard you were looking for me, and why do you look so happy? Alexander inquired. What's not to be happy about? Until last week, I was a prisoner of crazy sorcerers in Stygai. People say that no one comes back alive from there. And here I am. Ha ha ha. Though I did lose my wings. He then showed a sad expression for a split second. Wings? He asked. Yes, my name's Kevin, from the city of the winged men. We winged men don't really have real wings but for some reason, our arms are very strong. So strong that we can wear fake wings made of leather and fly in the air. I was originally a merchant but a sorcerer caught and did tests on my arms. Since then, I haven't been able to fly anymore. Ah, I'll miss that, he explained. Alexander was truly surprised by the story. The men of the winged city must have gone through some mutations due to that black liquid from the moon. He still felt bad for the poor guy. I am very sad to hear that Kevin. Please tell me what can I do for you, he asked. Haha. <laughs> well, after the sorcerers suddenly disappeared I checked around the whole stay guy and found these beautiful stones, he said and took out six egg-like stone with beautiful patterns on them. With just one look Alexander understood that they were dragon eggs. Haha. <laughs> These really are pretty but they aren't stones, son, Alexander said. Kevin looked at his stone with interest and asked. Then what are they? They are old dragon eggs he calmly replied. What? Dragon eggs? Haha. <laughs> then getting caught by the sorcerers was a blessing, Kevin said and laughed. Hmm. Three of these must be the ones Daenerys gets as her wedding gift in the show, but I'm pretty sure I had taken away all dragons and eggs from here to Dracium. Did they fall later from the remaining part of the moon? He asked himself and decided to check the moon in the future. Yes, so, how much do you want for them? He asked. Um, I really have no idea how much I should ask for dragon eggs. Kevin replied. All right, what about this? I'll give you 20,000 gold dragons, a ship to use for trading, membership in my merchant guild, and a medicine that can heal your arms. He offered. If you can heal my arms, I don't want anything else, Kevin firmly replied. Alexander took out a vial from his desk and gave it to him. Drink this. Kevin surprisingly didn't ask anything and straight up downed the vial. After some minutes, he started feeling warm in his arms. Whoa, yes. Yes, I am feeling stronger. I think I can fly again. He checked out his arms excitedly. Haha. <laughs> good, good. The other items are also prepared for you. You can take them whenever you want, he said. But, I don't need anything else, Kevin denied. Dragon eggs aren't cheap, son. You earned the money. Now, go and see your new ship. Ha ha ha. Okay, Lord Stark. Pleasure doing business with you, Kevin left. What a weird guy. What merchant says no to money, Alexander murmured. Sigh, should I give three of them to little Dany or not? Little Rena, John, and Eric can see dragons whenever they want in Dracium, but what about Dany? Though she does have the biggest dragon by her side as an old man. I am also not sure what the future holds. By the speed I am conquering the world, Dany wouldn't need dragons. He fell into deep thoughts.